We say that while shaking. I find it amusing to watch it sometimes. I love it. It's just all so fun. Hey, I just ran over with Cherry Lemons. Thank you so much for making the trip. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't connect no, last okay. night. I kept looking at the email way too late. Yeah, no, I was, uh, I was here till last night. You're our first subcommittee hearing, so there's a lot of like <laughs> little kinks to work out along the way. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're starting. And, yeah. and yeah. the testimony all looks really great. Yeah. And we've got a good, strong panel, and the members are armed with yeah. good questions based okay. on the testimonies. So it should be good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything specific that you want to talk about? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know the nuance of technology. I'm out of uh, technology. Yeah, no, no, no. And that's, that's I mean, part of the yeah. like <laughs> 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 we have people who are to talk to the public, we have people who are going to be looking at Medicare and Medicare and talk about it. And like, it matters to me. And that's important to me. Okay. Thank you. Who can't make cases? Yeah, I told you. I called Chris
Davis with Mozilla, if you have time. Sitting next to somebody who's enjoying his meal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll follow her later. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
nice to see you. Thank you so much. Hi. Nice to meet you. Of course, thank you for inviting me. Hi. Oh, nice to meet you. Thank you. Yes. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Got us packed in here today. Six is a lot you know, of witnesses. So far, we're all friendly, so I think that that's okay. Hi, how are you? Hi, nice to meet you. Yes, Jessica Gonzalez, very nice to meet you. Said good luck. Do I need luck? I mean, you I have what you, you have. What you have, not any meaner than usual. <laughs> hmm. There's no need to be mean. That's we'll funny. just stick to the facts. Yeah. <laughs> Is it your first time, or you done this before? <laughs> Miss Clark. Anna, huh. you're, you're that way, Anna. <laughs> Everyone's adjusting to the new. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. 
Good morning. I think all members have uh, taken their seats. I know we're getting used to where we sit right now because uh, we've done a little switching. But uh, I want to call the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology uh, to order. Uh, before we get started, uh, I want to congratulate Congressman Bob Latta on taking over the ranking member. Uh, Bob, I look forward to working with you in this Congress to address our shared interest. Uh, and I'd also like to introduce the new members uh, of the committee on the majority side and welcome them to the subcommittee. Uh, they are Congressman Mark Vesey of Texas, Congressman Donald McKeekin of Virginia, Congressman Darren Soto of Florida, and Congressman Tom O'Halloran of Arizona. And we also have some new friends and returning favorites who have also joined the subcommittee, uh, including Congresswoman Diana DeGette, who is holding a hearing downstairs uh, and probably will not make it up uh, here today. Uh, ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico, Kurt Trader of Oregon, and Tony Cardenas of California. Uh, I look forward to working with all of you. Um, Bob, uh, a deal to do if thank you, you want to introduce your new members. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I want to congratulate you on uh, assuming the gavel. And I really look forward to working with you. Uh, this is, uh, as we all know, this is the greatest committee in Congress, and this is a great subcommittee to be on. So I look forward to, to working with you. And uh, we all know that uh, the bipartisanship that uh, this uh, committee has exhibited through the years is exemplary. And I think over 94% of the bills that went out of the committee last Congress were bipartisan. So I look forward to working with you. First, I would like to uh, in introduce two new members to our uh, subcommittee. First is uh, Congressman Tim Wahlberg from Michigan. Uh, Tim uh, joined the uh, committee last Congress, but this is his first uh, term being on the subcommittee. So, Tim, we look forward to working with you. And, uh, you know, there's always great cooperation, not just uh, because Tim and I share a border. Uh, he says I protect his southern flank, which is Ohio. He, I, he protects my northern flank in no Michigan. So if Ohio and Michigan can work together, we can all work together. So, <laughs> Except in the football field. But we're not going blue. Uh, <laughs> and also would like to introduce to our new to the committee is Greg uh, Gianforte from Montana. He brings expertise in computer science, electrical engineering, and technology, and so we welcome him to the committee. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, before we get started, uh, I do want to mention uh, some sad news that we got this week. We know our, our dear friend and, and former chairman and longtime member of this committee, John Dingle, uh, is now in hospice care uh, as he's being uh, treated for cancer. Uh, we want to uh, hold John and Debbie Dingle, who's a great member of this committee, uh, in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, I want to welcome everyone to the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology's first hearing of the 116th Congress. Um, first of all, I want to thank my colleagues on the Energy and Commerce Committee for making me chair of this subcommittee. I consider it a great honor and a great responsibility to hold this gavel. And I look forward to working with all my colleagues on the committee. I believe we share many of the same goals and values. I believe in the power of competition to spark innovation, expand access, and give consumers a better experience at a lower price. Today's hearing is on net neutrality. I believe this is one of the most important digital rights issues we face today. The Internet is certainly one of the most influential inventions ever, and today, it touches almost all aspects of our economy, culture, and politics. According to the estimates by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the digital economy accounts for 6.5 percent of the total U.S. economy, or roughly $1.2 trillion a year in GDP. Last year, the PI FCC repealed the 2015 Open Internet Order. Let me be clear, this repeal had far greater impact than just removing the FCC's net neutrality rules. It was a step back by the FCC from its role as an agency that regulates and oversees Internet access, and a fundamental shift from all previous FCC chairs who worked to put in place enforceable net neutrality rules and preserve the Commission's vital oversight and consumer protection rules. Today, 
the online publication Motherboard is again reporting that mobile carriers sold access to millions of consumers' real-time locations to bounty hunters and who knows wh who else. Their investigation found that one entity had requested more than 18,000 data location requests. These allegations are very troubling and need to be addressed and investigated. Last year, firefighters in California had their mobile command center's internet connection slowed down to a snail's pace because they exceeded their data limit. Because of the FCC's repeal of the open internet order, and specifically repeal of sections 201 and 202 of the Communications Act, as well as the general conduct standard, the firefighters couldn't call the FCC to restore critical access to their systems. Instead, they had to call wireless, their wireless company and pay a representative over the phone to increase their data plan, while in the midst of fighting the largest, most complex fire in California's history. In fact, because of the repeal, these practices were permissible under the FTC's jurisdiction because they were disclosed in the terms of service. Now, if we agree that public safety is a priority, we need to make sure that they are a priority, not just another subscriber. We not only need rules on the books that protect and preserve our nation's digital economy, we need a cop on the beat, and the FCC is the agency that was empowered by Congress to protect consumers, competition, and innovations, and innovators' access to the Internet. Uh, with that, I'd like to yield the remainder of my time to my colleague, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo. I thank the chairman, and I, I congratulate you, Mr. Doyle, on being the chairman of this um, uh, great subcommittee, and uh, uh, it's wonderful for the whole committee to be together today, and I can't think of a more important subject uh, uh, to be examining. Uh, I want to reinforce what you just said about uh, what happened last summer. Uh, this is a fire department that is part of my district in Santa Clara County. If those of you that don't know the area, you know it by the moniker Silicon Valley. Uh, these were Santa Clara County firefighters, and they were battling uh, one of the worst forest fires in the history of the state of California. Now, uh, their data speeds uh, were slashed. Now, just picture what's going on. This is an emergency. This is real red lights and sirens blaring, people's lives at stake, and they weren't able to communicate the firefighters weren't able to communicate with each other to get the directions they needed to do their jobs. Now, if the 2015 open internet rules, uh, they could have prevented this because it, they had, there were specific exemptions for public safety. Now, I don't take a backseat to anyone on public safety issues and uh, telecommunications. Uh, Congressman Shimkus and I have been on this for more years than we want to count. Um, so, you know, um, you, what, what do we want to chalk this up to? Misbehavior? Bad PR? Um, listen, this is the United States of America. We have to have a first-rate system that works for everyone. And that's why the 2015 rules, Internet rules, are so, so important. And that's why this hearing is so important. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, gentlewoman. Uh, the chairman now recognizes Mr. Latta, the ranking member. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm very uh, glad to see that we're starting off with this subject uh, that has attracted so much attention over the past 15 years. Despite the long track record on net neutrality, I believe there is plenty of room for consensus here. And there is also great need for consensus. In my district, as in many others across the nation, our constituents want us to focus on getting broadband out to close the digital divide. And the uncertainty generated by these years of net neutrality wars is very unhelpful to that goal. So I'm hopeful that this, year, this is the year we can finally come together on a permanent legislative solution. I'd also like to welcome our witnesses, especially former FCC Chairman Michael Powell. As chairman, he had the distinction of creating a bipartisan consensus on this subject in 2004. The four internet freedoms he outlined for consumers, freedom to access the lawful content of their choice, use applications and devices of their choice, 
and receive meaning, meaningful uh, information about their service plans still serve as benchmarks for what we are trying to accomplish with net neutrality rules. Since then, there have been several attempts to create consensus in Congress, and I think it would be instructive for us to go back and consider some of them as potential starting points for our conversation this year. To that end, yesterday I introduced a bill that closely tracks Chairman Waxman's proposed legislation from 2010, the attempt to add a compromise on this issue from our Democratic colleagues on this committee. Like most attempts over the years in Congress and the FCC alike, the bill focuses on the potential behavior of concern, namely blocking, throttling, and discriminatory practices. What it does not include is the drastic outlier measure of reclassing broadband into, into Title II, the part of the statute meant to regulate the monopoly telephone carriers of the last century. And to that end, that, uh, this, is, uh, this is Title II. It harkens back to an error where we have a telephone that doesn't even have a dial on it. This was used by my ancestors, and this is what we don't want to go back to. And the phones weren't all that uh, uh, was uh, heavy about Title II. Title II carries with it close to 1,000 carrier regulations, a nightmare of government micromanagement, both for the providers bringing the power of the Internet into our pockets on de devices like these, of course, our, every, everyone has on them today are iPhones, and for their cons consumers alike. Reversing the consensus on classification made by Chairman Powell Martin Genachowski, the FCC dropped the ANVO on Title II onto broadband providers in 2015. At the time, the FCC did not forbear from applying over 700 of those regulations to broadband service, at least temporarily. But that just begs the question of why anyone still views Title II as a critical component to net neutrality legislation instead of complete overkill. Chairman Waxman recognized these th three, three years after the first iPhone was introduced that he didn't need Title II to protect Chairman Powell's four freedoms and ensure an open Internet, and we don't either. In fact, since the reversal of the 2015 open Internet order, the Internet has continued to remain open and free. Americans have not been restricted from freely searching, posting, or streaming content. It's clear that Title II is not needed to protect consumer access to the Internet. I look forward to the hearing from all of our witnesses today, and I look forward to moving forward on a long-awaited legislative compromise. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, Chairman of the Full Committee, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Doyle. And I want to uh, thank, first of all, I'm glad to see that you're a chair, uh, but I also want to thank you for all that you've done over the years on the subject matter of this uh, subcommittee, but particularly on net neutrality because you were the sponsor of the CRA resolution. Today's hearing examines a communication service that is essential to consumers and businesses alike. The Internet is indispensable to modern life and a catalyst for American innovation and social interaction. Until last year, both Republican and Democratic-led FCCs recognized that net neutrality principles were core for ensuring the Internet remained free and open. Until last year, both Republican and Democratic FCCs believed that when consumers paid their hard-earned money each month to connect to the Internet, that they should get access to the entire Internet. And until last year, both Republican and Democratic FCCs would not in agreement that your Internet service provider should not be the one deciding what you see, how you see it, and when you see it. But then came t President Trump, and the FCC uh, stepped in, well, I should say this, before Trump, the FCC stepped in uh, to stop net neutrality violations that stifled innovative technologies and allowed ISPs to pick winners and losers on the Internet. They knew that consumers would lose if the government stood by and did nothing. And that's because the history of broadband is chock full of bad behavior that strong net neutrality protections like those in FCC's 215 order were designed to address. And I'd like to introduce an article for the record from the Free Press detailing many of those violations uh, with your permission, Mr. Chairman. Without but objection, so ordered. But instead of standing with the American people uh, with the FCC's 215 order, uh, when President Trump came in, the Trump FCC eliminated common sense net neutrality protections under the guise of promoting broadband investment. While ISPs told the FEC what it wanted to hear, its senior executives told a different tale to investors. Hindsight tells us that the ISPs were more honest to Wall Street than the FCC, and despite enormous tax benefits from the GOP tax scam and the elimination of net neutrality rules, many of the largest ISPs invested less in broadband than in previous years. 
And again, the Trump FCC ignored the millions of Americans pleading for strong net neutrality protections. The agency falsely claimed the flood of pro-net neutrality comments were a denial of service attack. And shortly thereafter, it accepted an onslaught of bogus submissions aimed at skewing the FCC's rulemaking against net neutrality clearly. Now, I just believe that Chairman Pai's mind was made up from the beginning and the Trump administration's mind was made up from the beginning. I often remember listening to uh, 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 TV one night when the, uh, the, I forget that guy uh, who was the President Trump's first uh, press secretary said, oh, don't worry, the FCC is going to repeal the net neutrality rule. And uh, Spicer, he yeah, was on Saturday night all the time. And Spicer said, don't worry, uh, you know, long before the FCC even took action, we're going to repeal net neutrality. You know, I was always told that the FCC was supposed to be an independent commission and make and not make up their mind and not have the administration decide for them, you know, before they even decided what to do. But that clearly wasn't the case uh, with uh, President Trump. In the wake of the repeal, the Republican-led Senate passed a Congressional Re Review Act resolution rejecting the FCC's mistake, and 182 members of the House supported the same. That was Mike Doyle's resolution in the House. But Speaker Ryan ignored the public, and so the American people handed control of the House to Democrats in November, giving us a second chance. Without a change, there is no backstop to make sure big corporations can't use their power over the choke points of the Internet to undermine and silence their small competitors or the political opposition. Consumers don't have anywhere to turn when they're wronged by these large corporations because the FCC took itself off the beat entirely. Consumers are left watching the Internet slowly change in front of their eyes. Research shows many ISPs are throttling streaming uh, video service or boosting some websites over others. Wireless Internet providers charge consumers an HD fee just like your pay-for-TV company. And this is all happening when ISPs are on their best behavior because the court is considering whether to overturn Chairman Pai's order and they know Congress is watching. So I shudder to think what plans are being hatched up for when they think no one is watching. Those plans won't be good for consumers' competition or innovation. Mr. Chairman, until strong open Internet protections are enacted, our only hope is the millions of Americans were fed up and will hold Congress accountable for passing strong net neutrality laws. And I look forward to working in a bipartisan manner to return strong safeguards to the Internet. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, because uh, this has always been something that you care so much about. And I know that by having this hearing today that we're going to move forward to have a free and open Internet again. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Walden ranking member of the full committee for five minutes for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much and congratulations <laughs> on taking over the gavel of a really cool subcommittee. <laughs> Having chaired this for six years, uh, I can tell you it's, well, you can't pick among your children when you're a chairman or the, or the top Republican leader on the committee, but this is a pretty good subcommittee. So I look forward to continuing the work. And I want to welcome all of our witnesses here. I cannot help uh, myself a bit. Uh, in terms of presidential pressure on net neutrality, we should not forget the, the video that President Obama put out uh, in the middle of the NPRM, uh, Mr. Wheeler had, that I believe caused an enormous pivot in November of 2014 after the election, um, pushing forward toward Title II regulation. Because I know from meetings I had prior to that, um, that was not necessarily the first course of action uh, that the FCC was headed toward. So I don't know that uh, he ever made Saturday Night Live, but... Uh, uh, certainly there was presidential push to go toward the 2015 Title II. Um, look, the Internet has been the single most important driver of economic growth, job creation, and better quality of life for Americans and people worldwide. It's brought us together. It's been amazing in terms of uh, the innovation it's brought in every sector of our lives. And all of that blossomed under uh, a regime of light touch regulation, not Title II, not your grandparents' phone there. Um, or whoever's it is, uh, it was light touch. And, and entrepreneurs and innovators in Silicon Valley and everywhere else didn't have to come to the government and get permission to do what they did that gave us what we had. It was only under, under the, uh, the Wheeler regime that we got this heavy government approach and asked the government first idea under Title II. Um, I'm delighted that uh, my friend Joe Fresnel could be here from Eastern Oregon Telecom. Um, he made the long trip from Hermiston, Oregon, um, and he has a very important voice in this debate about Title II and about how we close the digital divide in rural America. Now, I know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle like to throw big rocks at anybody that's a big corporation. Well, you're talking to the small operator here. 
Now, in eastern Oregon, we might consider him to be a big operator, but these are the kind of people, the ISPs, that are putting things together to close the digital divide in difficult-to-serve areas. And so thanks for being here, and I want to welcome the other witnesses, and especially uh, former Chairman Powell uh, be here as well. You actually created bipartisan consensus on this back in 2004, and, uh, and I, I think the principles you put forth then uh, should guide us today, and so I'll look forward to your, your testimony as well. And I think we should be able to agree on this committee on bipartisan solutions we could put in statute to stop bad behavior uh, by ISPs. As Mr. Ladd outlined, Title II is the outlier in our debate. It throws away 20 years of bipartisan consensus that built the modern Internet, and it replaces it with an authority that dates back to the early 1900s used to govern monopoly telephone companies. It may sound innocuous, Title II, but it gives enormous power to the federal government and unlimited authority to micromanage every single aspect of a provider's business, including rates. There's nothing neutral about that kind of authority. For 15 years, every attempt at legislative compromise from both sides of the aisle has addressed rules on blocking, throttling, and discriminatory behavior like paid prioritization without Title II authority. But efforts to reach agreement have unfortunately failed. I acknowledge there might have been times when our side should have accepted some offers, but the same could be true and said for the other side. Um, that's why I have introduced the offer I made in 2015 which codifies the FCC's protection so they are not subject to changing administrations and commissions. The bill prohibits blocking. It prohibits throttling and paid prioritization and requires that ISPs be transparent in their network management practices and prices. This is the offer, by the way, that's been on the table that preceded Mr. Wheeler's uh, 2015 proposal. If my colleagues don't agree to this, uh, that's the right starting point. And my friend Mr. Latta has introduced legislation drawn directly from former Chairman Waxman's proposal from 2010 that he also filed with the FCC, as then Chairman Janikowski was drawing up the 2010 offer. Of course, as a former state legislator, I realize that some of the best ideas actually come from our states, and in this case, my neighbor to the north, Washington State. My colleague, Ms. Rogers, has a bill that would give you the Washington State net neutrality rules from 2018. So it's important to point out that Washington State has a bicameral legislature in which Democrats control both houses as well as the governorship. As a permanent legislative solution, we should make that our goal, to produce in good faith what our colleagues have talked about all along. So I'm once again asking my friends across the aisle to work with us on a bipartisan solution. And let me close with this. I want to read from a letter um, that uh, is from 2010. And it says, and I quote, classifying broadband internet access as telecommunication services that are subject to the provisions of Title II of the Communications Act may have far-reaching implications. To reclassify these services is to create uncertainty, something that is sure to adversely affect investment decisions and job creation, both of which are in short supply right now. This is a job for Congress. Chairman Pallone, I couldn't agree more with you. This was your letter from 2010, and I look forward to reaching across the aisle to find a solution here that will give certainty to the market and protection to consumers, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, I'll re remind my friend that the <laughs> past efforts of both Republican and Democratic FCC chairmen uh, to do it in the way that you described was struck down by the courts, and the only rule was uh, the Tom Wheeler rule that was also taken the court was upheld by the courts. If uh, the gentleman would uh, yield since he referenced uh, No, it. no, we're going to get started now. Thank you. Uh, the chair want to remind Got all it. members uh, that pursuant to committee rules, all members' written opening statements will be made part of the record. Uh, I'd now like to introduce our witnesses for today's hearing uh, and welcome them all to this committee. Uh, first, we have Ms. Donnell Dixon who is Chief Operating Officer of Mozilla. Next, we have Ms. Ruth Livier, an actress, writer, and UCLA doctoral student. Mr. Joseph Fresnel, a General Manager and CEO of Eastern Oregon Telecom. Ms. Jessica Gonzalez, Vice President of Strategy and Senior Counsel at Free Press and Free Press Action Fund. Uh, former FCC Commissioner Michael Powell, who's now President and CEO of NCTA. Uh, welcome back, Commissioner. And last but certainly not least, uh, Tom Wheeler, 
Tom Wheeler, former commissioner who, Tom, I know you're before this committee more than any other FCC commissioner, and you thought you'd never have to come back here, uh, but here you are, and, and, and thank you. Uh, Tom is a fellow with the Brookings Institute. Uh, we want to thank all our witnesses for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Uh, at this time, uh, the chair will now recognize each witness for five minutes to provide their opening statement. Before we begin, uh, in front of our, I want to just talk a little bit about the lighting systems for those of you that are new to testifying here. Uh, in, in front of you, uh, you'll see a series of lights. Uh, the light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. Uh, it's going to turn yellow when you have one minute remaining. Uh, so please be prepared to wrap up your testimony at that point. And when the light turns red, your time has expired. So with that, Ms. Dixon, uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Doyle, Ranking Member Lada, and members of the subcommittee. Thanks to net neutrality, with the touch of a button, an owner of a small business in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or in Perrysburg, Ohio, can get on the open web and instantly reach billions of customers around the world. She doesn't need to negotiate with multiple ISPs to make sure none of those customers are blocked from shopping on her site. She doesn't need to hire an army of lawyers to make sure that she isn't put in Comcast or Verizon's slow lane. She only needs to make sure that she is creating the best product for her customers. That is the genius of net neutrality. An open internet with IS without ISP gatekeepers where the best ideas and businesses can be seen instantly. And that is what we're here to talk about today. My name is Danelle Dixon. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Mozilla Corporation. We are the makers of the open source Firefox browser and other web-based products and services. As defenders of the open internet, Mozilla has a long history for, of support for net neutrality, and we remain as committed as ever to the strong net neutrality protections and clear FCC authority. Given the importance of this issue to internet users all around the world, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify. I would like to make three points today. First, Net neutrality is essential for businesses online, and particularly small businesses. We need an internet where small businesses can flourish by delivering what users want, finding the gaps and opportunities in the market that aren't being served, and delivering those. I am certain that Mozilla would not be here today without net neutrality. And if you look around the tech industry, this, and play, th this same origin story is repeated over and over. Losing net neutrality does, not, does more than just lock in the positions of dominant players. It also stifles the market of ideas, puts innovation behind a barrier of permission and negotiation, and places roadblocks in front of diverse viewpoints and approaches. Second, while the FCC has worked to repeal these protections over the last two years, the case for net neutrality, net neutrality has grown even stronger. The FCC claimed that repealing net neutrality wouldn't pose any problems and would instead unlock investment and competition in the telecom industry. But here's what we've actually seen over the last two years. We've seen Verizon slow connections of California firefighters as they battle the blaze. And research from Northeastern University and the University of Massachusetts reports providers are slowing internet traffic to and from popular video streaming services like YouTube and Netflix. Did the repeal unlock massive ISP investment as promised? No. The, the data says that major ISP infrastructure investment has in fact declined. This shouldn't be surprising because remember, after the 2015 rules were adopted, major ISP executives in quarterly earnings calls told their shareholders that the FCC's actions would not impact their investments. Similarly, many opponents of net neutrality claim that competition among internet service providers would be enough to protect users and small businesses. But competition among ISPs remains an illusion today. Roughly half of this country has at most one option for high-speed access. And third, we must restore strong net neutrality protections and clear FCC authority today. There is no time to waste. We need to protect net neutrality. And the clearest path forward today is to restore the protections of the 2015 order through litigation. That's why Mozilla led the effort to file suit against the FCC in the DC Circuit Court, 
And we were joined by a broad coalition of public interest organizations, public sector agencies, and technology, technology companies. We understand the value of legislative solution to provide lasting protections, but any effort must offer, at the very least, the protections that are as strong as the 2015 order with adequate and flexible authority for the FCC to enforce it. Anything less does a disservice to consumers. In conclusion, as a business leader, I would note how unfortunate it is to see this issue take on such a partisan view in DC. Polling shows that the broad majority of Americans, both Republicans and Democrats, support net neutrality. Promoting a level playing field of competition and innovation is not a Democratic or a Republican value. It is an American value. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. We now recognize Ms. Livier. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. In 2014, I testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee on how net neutrality changed my life as a Hollywood entertainment professional. I shared that the open internet put worldwide distribution of media content at the fingertips of independent artists like me. This gave us the unprecedented opportunity to tell our stories from our points of view and share them globally without the financial and corporate gatekeeping roadblocks of traditional media. It empowered us to define ourselves. This matters because the media produced by Hollywood historically tell an incomplete and unbalanced narrative about US society. Latinx communities are largely misrepresented, symbolically annihilated, and or positioned as peripheral characters in someone else's story. With net neutrality rules in place to ensure that internet access service would remain open, with low barriers to entry, artists could actively participate in balancing Hollywood's irresponsible exclusions. Net neutrality is the reason I went from approaching a traditional media executive for advice on a script I had written and being told by them, who are you for anyone to produce your show? Two, years later, becoming the first person to join the Writers Guild of America West via my work in digital media for a web series that I produced based on that very same script. The difference between these two scenarios is, was that camera equipment was no longer cost prohibitive and the exciting new frontier of the open internet allowed the rest of us, regardless of ethnicity or socioeconomic standing, to finally tell our stories without getting discouraged, derailed, or turned away. Net neutrality is about ensuring that traditional media's exclusionary practices are not transferred and amplified by broadband providers. It is about who has the power to control narratives and does shape perceptions and perspectives. This has significant impacts on society. For marginalized communities, our representation or lack thereof is, can be a matter of life or death. When we are dehumanized in the media, it makes it easier for immoral individuals and groups to justify their targeted aggressions against us. A neutral internet is, for, empowers us to virtually walk arm in arm with the confidence of knowing that our voices matter and we are not alone, that we are not invisible, and that our experiences are not isolated. In the summer of 2018, for example, a group of Latinx entertainment media colleagues and I formed a group to rally against the cruelty of family separations. Because of net neutrality, we were able to learn about the crisis from a variety of online sources. Brave journalists, activists, and whistleblowers exposed the injustices that were and continue to be perpetrated on brown men, women, and children on a, at our southern border and beyond. The open internet allowed us to organize and to join forces to push back against this administration's inhumanity. As a Latina who has grown up in a low-income family where English is our second language, I have first-hand experiences of how much you have to juggle just to stay afloat and how mentally, physically, and emotionally exhausting it can be to navigate daily and persistent forms of oppression. The system is so relentlessly stacked against you that it just seems easier to give up, tune out, and put your head down and believe the myth that there's nothing that we can do, that that's just the way things are. But social inequities are social constructs. They have been construct structured to serve particular purposes, helping some and harming many other human beings in very real and very personal ways. Net neutrality is a ray of light that can put us on the path to bridging some of these inequities by affording us the option to make ourselves vis visible and to make our voices heard in the digital spaces. This policy is also about protecting our ability to have access to job opportunities, since more and more jobs are being partially or fully migrated onto the digital space. This is true for me as an act actress. Some of my jobs now take place in the digital arena. As a UCLA doctoral student, this is within the area of my research. 
taking a cue from my academic advisor, Dr. Sarah T. Roberts, and her brown, great, groundbreaking work in digital labor, my research sheds light on the relationship between the exclusionary structures of traditional media and the exploitation of human beings who are doing creative work in digital environments. My ability to do this research would be significantly hindered without net neutrality, without access to diverse viewpoints, and within such a mediated and corporate-facing environment. A few powerful internet service providers should not be entitled to mediate our voices, to frame discourses in order to serve their interest, nor to decide who or what is worthy of being visible and or invisible in our society, or under what conditions. Net neutrality impacts human beings in very real ways every single day. It impacts our ability to participate in society, to make a living, to connect with our loved ones, to earn an education, and to collaborate in pushing back against social inequities. Market discourses serve the market and are designed to keep conversations within certain parameters. I'm here to participate in highlighting the human impa impacts of net neutrality because things look different from a human perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now recognize uh, Mr. Fresnel. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Pallone and Doyle. Oh, sorry. Good morning, Chairman Pallone and Doyle, Vice Chair Matsui, and Republican leaders Walden and Latta and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. It's an honor to be here and talk about net neutrality and the consequences of applying Title II to the Internet. The application of Title II as part of net neutrality had a dramatic chilling effect on rural telecom in the Pacific Northwest, and I suspect the same could be said of the rest of the country. The uncertainty of the regulatory environment, even on non-regulated telcos and internet service providers like Eastern Oregon Telecom, made investors hesitant to invest in the telecommunications sector. Uh, further, the ill-informed public fervor and fear surrounding the net neutrality subject precluded any objective discussion of the topic. This resulted in distrust of and anger towards ISPs like my company that had never manipulated their networks or internet protocol traffic in any anti-competitive nature. It also prompted state legislation forcing net neutrality practices on local providers who again had never violated the public trust and had no interest in anti-competitive behavior. All of this took place without the ability to have an objective discussion about the scope of the problem and how to address it without harming the internet, all because of the fear mongering by those who didn't fully understand the subject or had other reasons for advancing Title II application to the internet. Yes, I believe Title II had begun to harm the internet in the US and a reapplication of it has a very real possibility of resulting in unforeseen and irrevocable damage in the future. I applaud your interest in having an objective conversation about the subject in this hearing today. Since the repeal of net neutrality, investors have been much more willing and perhaps eager to invest in rural telecommunications. Additionally, my company has been able to focus on continuing to provide exceptional telecommunications and is currently expanding into other markets that are underserved. We do this with confidence because we don't have to concern ourselves with unnecessary regulatory interference and the draining cost of reporting and compliance. I believe that Title II does not have to be, nor should it be, part of the solution to the problem of bad behavior by a few internet service providers. Such application of Title II would not just be damaging, but also unnecessary. When I say unnecessary, I say so because my company does not participate in the bad behavior that started the net neutrality debate in the first place. In fact, I don't know of any rural provider in Oregon who does. Nevertheless, I do believe that further discussion on the topic of prioritization of traffic is warranted. As a society, we apply different values to everything, sometimes rightly and sometimes not. In fact, I think we would all agree that as most forms of information, voice, data, video, et cetera, are now being moved via internet protocol, some are clearly more important than others. Here are some of my own examples. A long distance call to 911 should take priority over a regular call. If my daughter was in a car wreck and had a head injury uh, late one night, I would want the digital imaging that needed to be analyzed remotely by a radiologist or surgeon to take priority over someone else's online gaming tournament. Students participating in distance education or online standardized testing should get priority over those streaming online movies for entertainment. Prioritization of traffic becomes a problem only when it's done to harm or eliminate the competition and there are consumer protection laws in place that target this type of behavior. 
adding additional layers of regulatory burden is not the answer. Instead of adding to that burden, I encourage you to consider leaving the longstanding Title I regulation of the Internet in place, abandon any initiative to reinstate Title II through legislation and address the anti-competitive abuses that everyone fears with light touch surgical precision. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not advocate for initiatives from this committee specifically designed to promote competition in the marketplace. Giving consumers choices for their internet service offers the greatest mechanism for rewarding the good performer and punishing the bad performer. If enough customers choose to leave, the bad performer will either adjust their behavior or go out of business. Only robust competition in the marketplace ensures innovation, lowers prices, and, excellent, and ensures excellent customer service. A complacent monopoly has no incentive to change. Robust competition is the answer. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Gonzalez, you now have five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Doyle and uh, committee, full committee ranking member Walden, calling him out on the way out, excuse me. Uh, members of the subcommittee, thanks for very much for having me. I'm here today on behalf of Free Press's 1.4 million members who are calling for reinstatement of the FCC's 2015 net neutrality rules and the return of the FCC's legal authority to protect us from ISP discrimination and abuse. I'm also here as a Mexican-American woman from a working class family. My father grew up in a Los Angeles suburb where Mexicans were not allowed to live. I understand that millions of people who came before me, including members of this house, past and present, have fought against discrimination and for other causes that enabled me to be here today. I say this to underscore that what we're doing here really has impacts on real people's lives. The US government has a long history of discrimination and racism. Indeed, used the media system to legitimize the enslavement of black people and the genocide and displacement of native peoples. And although it's taken some steps to reduce racism and discrimination in certain aspects of American life, like housing, it's done little to remedy structural racism in the communications sector. The FCC's 2015 net neutrality order is one exception. That order gave the FCC clear authority to prevent and investigate shady ISP business practices, like, but not limited to, blocking, throttling, and discriminating against lawful content. The Trump FCC's 2017 decision to repeal that order was wildly unpopular. Polls show that 82% of Republicans, 90% of Democrats, and 85% of in independents object. And people of color have some, been some of the most vo uh, vocal critics in part because we have more at stake. Never before in history have barriers to entry been lower for us to reach a large audience with our own stories and our own words, to start small businesses, to organize for change. This hits close to home for me because my best friend Vanessa is a blogger and small business owner. While she was pregnant and in the midst of the Great Recession, she was laid off from her job, and she began blogging from her apartment in 2010 after her daughter's birth. It was a labor of love. Her intention was to fill the void of content designed for and by parents of multiracial children. She began writing love letters to her daughter to ensure that the beauty and power of black and brown women were front and center, even in a world that subjugates us at every turn. Vanessa's blog, desumama.com, underscores that mothers are the storytellers, dream keepers, and legacy builders for the next generation. Today, Jason Mama has a loyal following and is building understanding across cultures. It's also a successful business that has helped Vanessa supplement the family income and supported her journey to, to home ownership. The end of net neutrality that means that her voice might be drowned out by corporate media that can pay more to access her audience. Some of the same corporate media that have failed spectacularly to represent us. This could impair her family's livelihood and the reach of her cultural influence. And Vanessa cares so deeply about this issue that she actually flew here from Long Beach, California. She's sitting behind me today uh, on her own dime to bear witness to this hearing. Not gonna look back there, I'll get emotional, but uh, uh, she really uh, believes that this is critical to her business model uh, and to her ability to spread the word. 
So I'll get on to the lawyer points. In my testimony, I go into great detail about how ISPs have abused their power when net neutrality is not in place. I'll give just a few examples here. Uh, we've seen Comcast secretly block and slow file sharing apps. We've seen Metro PCS announce plans to block streaming from all providers except for YouTube. AT&T said it would disable the use of FaceTime over all cell connections unless their customers paid for uh, higher cost options. AT&T, Time Warner Cable, and Verizon deliberately limited capacity at ISP interconnection points throttling Netflix. And those are just a few examples. And since the 2017 repeal, we've seen some seriously suspect ISP behavior that my colleague Donnell already uh, touched on. But because the FCC has sworn off its authority to protect broadband consumers, it doesn't even have the power to investigate and look into this. And the real shame of this whole thing is that net neutrality was working. Chairman Pai's justification for the repeal was built on a mountain of lies. Pai promised us that ISP investment and deployment declined under net neutrality and would expand following its repeal, but the numbers are in and that's just not true. I hope this new Congress seizes the opportunity to right the wrongs of the Pi FCC and restore fundamental protections to Americans. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner Powell, you have five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's always an honor and a privilege to be with you. I also send my prayers to the Dingles. John Dingles, a dear friend, and was a lion of the legislature, and our thoughts are with him. To be clear, the virtues of an open internet are simply unassailable. It has proven to be one of the most democratizing forces we have ever known, putting the power to innovate in the hands of billions. The ISP industry is proud of its role in building that network, and engineering it to be an open platform has been good for society, and it has been good for the bottom line. That is why we unequivocally support legislative efforts to codify open internet rules in a manner that preserves the incentives for investment and dynamic growth. But to craft rules that maximize public welfare, we must appreciate the symbiotic nature of the internet ecosystem. Just as great software depends on great hardware, the internet depends on an ever-improving network to facilitate cycles of ever-improving applications. We all recognize that users need an open internet to thrive, but we cannot ignore the fact that they also need the network to continuously innovate and improve. A startup needs confidence that the network will reach their customers. Rural communities need networks to reach them in remote regions. Consumers require high quality, secure, and reliable networks. And advanced applications will require even more powerful infrastructure. Put simply, the internet cake is not fully baked. It must continually innovate and improve, and policy must protect the conditions that make that possible. But Title II throws a wrench in the flywheel of innovation. Dumping a mountain of regulations designed for a different time, for a different network, with different economic conditions, and different consumer needs throws off the balance. Title II is a massive body of economic regulations. It lets the government set prices, decide the terms and conditions of services, and improve new products and services. Let's be transparent with the American public. A debate about Title II is not a debate about net neutrality. It is a debate about whether to regulate the Internet as a public utility with implications that go far beyond simply protecting the Internet. The old and haggard Title II should not be tucked in under the shimmering cloak of restoring net neutrality protections. The future of the Internet deserves more careful consideration. Moreover, a bill that includes Title II will rupture any hope of bipartisan legislation in a divided government, ensuring that the count for countless more years we will go by without the resolution the public deserves. There is unique common ground on which to build enduring net neutrality rules, and we should seize the opportunity rather than squander it. As you consider legislation, I would encourage you to heed the cautions that first do no harm. By almost every measure, the Internet ecosystem has thrived for decades. The Internet is the fastest deploying technology in the history of the world. It gets better at a relentless and unprecedented pace. It has been built with trillions of dollars of private capital, freeing public resources for other pressing societal needs. Innovation has advanced at a dizzying pace 
giving birth to startups that have grown to become global giants. And against this positive backdrop, there simply is no evidence of systematic patterns of ISPs undermining the openness of their networks. One must rigorously ask with an open mind, how will Title II utility regulation improve on these enviable results? And is it worth risking messing things up by adopting it? We have compelling evidence that utility regulations will mess things up. There's a voluminous literature documenting the negative effects of utility regulation on dynamic industries. To ignore it is to ignore the hard-won lessons of history. But we don't need to spend hours in the library reading economic articles. We have real-world examples right in front of us. In Europe, regulators did adopt utility-style regulation. And as a result, they've achieved substantially slower speeds and attracted dramatically less investment than in the United States. And on our own shores, we can see that our utility-based infrastructures in this nation are crumbling. The electric grid, our roads, our airports, and our drinking water have all earned failing grades due to chronic underinvestment under this regulatory approach. Is that truly the model we hope to emulate for the internet? In summary, software pro in software programming, an infinite loop is defined as a piece of coding that lacks a functional ex exit so that it repeats indefinitely. Net neutrality has been stuck in that infinite loop for way too long. It's time for Congress to debug this debate once and for all and reach a bipartisan solution that protects the open internet without damaging internet growth. Thank you, and we stand ready to help you do that. Thank you. Commissioner Wheeler, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Whoops. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to begin by uh, associating myself with my friend Michael and uh, his wishes for uh, the Dingle family. Um, in all the world, there was only one Big John, and uh, he is Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the things that allows me to reflect on that is that it seems like I have been before this committee so many times over the last 40 years. Um, first, when I had Michael's role at, as the CEO of NCTA, then when I had a similar role in the wireless industry, and then when I had the great privilege of being the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. But today, I appear before you as an American citizen who has 40 years of experience dealing and living at the intersection of new technology and public policy. The lesson of that is that net neutrality is not a new concept. Essential networks have always historically been required to be open. It started back in feudal times when, when English common law required that the ferryman had to provide non-discriminatory access to haul people across the river. When the telegraph came along, the first telecommunication service, in 1860, Congress said it must be non-discriminatory. Net neutrality was passed in 1860. When the railroads became the dominant network, Congress again stepped up and said, open and just and reasonable are the rules that have to govern that network. And of course, in the Communications Act of 1934, openness and just and reasonableness was applied to the telephone network. Now, let's be real clear. It was those policies that created the internet. It was the ability of anyone to access an open network that gave us ARPANET and AOL and everything else. The 2015 Open Internet Order extended those enduring principles to internet service providers while removing outdated and unnecessary Title II common carrier requirements. I understand why the ISPs don't like this. They want to be able to make their own rules. They argue that transmitting zeros and ones rather than analog somehow absolves them of the responsibility to be open and just and reasonable. 
That's kind of like saying that electric cars don't have to obey the speed limit because it was established for gas vehicles. No, there are enduring principles that apply to essential networks. Let me quickly address three policy issues that flow from that. One, the game is being played that we're dealing with an information service as opposed to a telecommunications service. It's clear what that effort is, to shoehorn the ISPs into a less regulatory structure. It is a phony construction. Regulating networks like the content they carry is just like saying that because a road leads to Macy's, that the road ought to be regulated the same way Macy's is. Justice Scalia said it a lot better when he said there's a difference between delivering a pizza and making a pizza. There's been a lot of talk about the second point I would make about how the Trump FCC presented false evidence that open internet regulation would hurt investment. But thirdly, focusing on blocking, throttling, and prioritization ignores the future and doesn't even protect today. It doesn't protect today because it says, you're free to discriminate, just don't do it this way. And worse than that, Michael was right. The cake is not fully baked. But those three principles apply Netflix concepts to a dynamic and constantly evolving internet. Today, the internet is about transporting things. Web 3.0, which is now upon us, is about a network that orchestrates, not transports. Today, 4G is about full signal transition. 5G is about network slicing into pieces. There must be a general expectation that no matter how technology develops, the essential networks must be open, just, and reasonable. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me say both to uh, Mr. Powell, Mr. Wheeler, I should have referred both of you as chairman, uh, not commissioner. There's enough chairman in this. this is my, <laughs> <laughs> my apologies. Uh, with the conclusion of witness testimony, uh, we're now going to move to member questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. Uh, I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. Chairman Wheeler. Sir. When the FCC enacted the open internet order, uh, it included the blight, bright line rules we all talked about, no blocking, no throttling, right. paid prioritization. But it also included a general conduct standard, consumer protections, and commission oversight of interconnection and zero rating policies. Can you briefly, and I would underline briefly, give us some examples of past problems that necessitated the addition of these, the, uh, the, these additional provisions in the order? Well, you've heard many of them being discussed in the, in the, in the previous uh, uh, testimony. Uh, there's a historical reality when Comcast tried to block uh, a P2P. Uh, there is the experience of Comcast trying to uh, block, not trying, but indeed blocking uh, ports uh, into their network. Uh, there is when uh, AT&T and Verizon said they would not allow Google Wallet uh, on their networks. It's when Verizon said they would not allow tethering apps on their wallet, so forcing you to pay 20 bucks for their tethering service. And it continues, as we've heard multiple times, you, Mr. Chairman, referenced the Mendocino fire. And what's significant about the Mendocino fire is not just the impact that it had on the firefighters, which is significant, but the impact it had on the people who were suffering as a result and who suddenly found that they were being throttled and had no place to go because the FCC had washed their hands. Um, the study from Northeastern University on, on throttling, how Sprint uh, degraded Skype, um, the whole, uh, and then the whole issue of the so-called zero rating. There is just a, f a study that just came out that proves that free is not free. The interesting thing is that 
What the study found was that data rates where zero rating free services are allowed are actually higher than where they are not allowed, which makes sense, of course, because somebody has to subsidize what some folks are getting for free. I mean, there's a, this is an ongoing, uh, uh, how creative can you be to figure out ways around it? Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Dixon, your company, Mozilla, has been the lead plaintiff in suing the FCC and hoping to overturn the PI FCC's repeal of the Open Internet Order. Can you also briefly tell us why you think these protections are critical for small businesses and innovation, and do you think that the bright line rules of the open internet alone are sufficient by themselves? The bright line rules are just three things we can rattle off very quickly and then ignore the fact that those bright line rules can be, you can get around those rules, there are loopholes everywhere. So they are not sufficient. Governance is incredibly important in this area and you cannot rely on the FTC consumer protection because it takes years for those things to correct harms that occurred years before. So you have to look at how we can stop the harm from occurring <coughs> so that Americans don't have to suffer during that time and then we lose years of innovation and opportunity because net neutrality rules wouldn't have been in place during that time period. So we can't actually make up for it by, by relying on the consumer protection statute. So there's a lot in there that needs to be looked at with respect to it. Uh, I believe very firmly that Mozilla actually wouldn't exist today if net neutrality hadn't been in play. So I'm gonna talk about that from the small business angle. We started 17 years ago or so. We did it because Microsoft had 95, 99% of the market share with respect to browsers. And we wanted to give users an opportunity for choice. And if Microsoft, for example, had been able to negotiate with ISPs during that time to say, let's just throttle or, or make it harder to get access to our download page, we wouldn't be here. The open internet rules, while they might not have existed in, in, the, in the order <coughs> as of 2015, they were status quo. That was how we operated. That is what the internet was built on. The openness, the transparency, the standardization, the requirement that we all work together, that is how we got to all of this record revenue that folks have today. So small businesses need an opportunity to participate in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tom, I just want to uh, get back to you just for one quick sec. You know, a lot has talked about Title II and my friends like these props uh, bringing the old phones up from the 1800s. Uh, <laughs> But Title II had many, many sections to it, and there was a lot of forbearance in your open internet order. Uh, many of the things that are concerns that were discussed, rate regulation and others, they were forbeared, weren't they? So um, I believe that Title II has like 45 sections, and we forbore, if that's the word, from <laughs> 27 of, of them. Um, and, and I'm, Mr. Latta, I'm just, I gotta pull this out because to say that this is also a Title II phone. Thank you, I see my, okay. I don't wanna abuse my time too much cause I'm hoping other members don't either. So with that, I will give uh, yield to uh, Mr. Latta for five minutes. I appreciate the chairman for yielding and uh, Chairman Powell, uh, we discussed the four freedoms for internet consumers that you outlined back in 2004. Your accomplishment in creating a bipartisan cons consensus at the commission looks even more impressive given what's happened in later commissions. Will you elaborate on the meaning of the first freedom, the freedom to access the lawful content of the consumer's choice? It seems to me that we've all agreed since then that nobody wants ISPs blocking content they don't like. In your opinion, is there a serious threat to free speech on the internet today? And if so, where is it coming from? I think that rule was a predecessor to what's ultimately uh, morphed into the no blocking, no throttling, paid prioritization concepts. It's important to remember historically at, a t at the time that we were announcing this, the internet was just burgeoning as a commercial service and it was really important to try to create a set of customer and corporate expectations about how the engineering aspects of the internet should evolve. Uh, we did that and I think that proved successful. In fact, not recently, uh, Reed Hastings of Netflix said quite squarely in his own earnings call that he believed the consumer expectation of net neutrality was so strong, even the repeal of rules wouldn't threaten them as a company, uh, and noted that many company countries don't have net neutrality rules in which they operate under open environments quite successfully uh, because of that expectation. Our rules were intended to generate that expectation of a, at a time when things were new. 
And, and I would highlight so many of the examples we hear about today about the flourishing invention of Mozilla or other products and services all took place during a period in which there were no net neutrality rules, uh, in which the fact exists that if you believe ISPs had the incentive and ability and desire to block content, throttle it, and impose paperization. They were free to do so for over 20 years with the creation of every product uh, from Google to Uber. Uh, and nonetheless, those products thrived and survived. Um, I think it is a misnomer that ISPs do not have a corporate self-interest in an open internet. Uh, to be blunt, they've made a whole lot of money uh, on an open internet because when you build a network with sunk cost, you're rewarded by filling that network with as much content as possible, and creating artificial scarcity uh, <coughs> just simply doesn't make economic sense. Thank you. Could I agree with my friend, Mr. Well, Powell? No, no, no not, not your time. Okay. Uh, continue on, uh, Chairman Powell. Uh, new applications are becoming uh, possible with advanced networks, such as self-driving vehicles, remote surgery, and augmented reality. These will require extremely time-sensitive network management, what impact would the 2015 FCC rules, if they were restored, have on these applications? Well, I'd like to be really clear, particularly on behalf of the cable industry, we don't dispute uh, or dissuade anybody from pursuing uh, a strong net neutrality codified rules that can be enforced. Um, the only thing that we have an objection to uh, is the ill-considered application of Title II. Uh, now, in credit to my colleague, Tom Wheeler, he was a regulator. He had a different problem than you have. He had the problem of finding a source <coughs> of limited authority in order to embrace the rules after a series of court cases that questioned whether they were acting beyond the authority that Congress had ever given them. This is not a limitation that applies to the United States Congress, whose power is unbounded by anything other than the Constitution. So the restoring of net neutrality is also restoring a sort of clever parlor trick to give the commission FCC jurisdiction where you otherwise did not provide it. But writing on a blank slate, as you have the power to do, there's no need to import uh, those steps in order to create effective rules. And so the restoring of them as is would create the same problem of unbalancing the flywheels of innovation I mentioned uh, in my opening statement. Let me just ask you one quick follow-up. You know, when you worked on the Poor Freedoms, how did you get that consensus at that time? Um, yeah, how does one ever get, get this? <laughs> let, let, let me, I, I think what I would tell you is that I think one of the things we've forgotten as lawyers have taken over the net neutrality debate, in the early days of the internet, open internet and net neutrality was an engineering principle. It wasn't a legal principle. It was the idea that you could use IP protocols and reach any consumer on any computer, whether it was a Macintosh or a Windows computer. Didn't matter what devices they used, what computers they used. And it ensured that it was a network that nobody centrally controlled, which is true today. In the phone network, it was like a spoken wheel in which somebody sat at the center of the network making all command and control decisions about the flow of traffic. In the internet world, there is no central orchestrator. Uh, the network is owned by no one at its core. Uh, and it flies around unfettered by any intervention. So, um, what we understood was we were trying to give voice in a regulatory sense to what had already become a pretty rigid <coughs> engineering concept. And there was pretty universal bipartisan agreement about that was, in fact, how the Internet worked, and any policy should reflect that. Now, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My time's expired, and I yield back. <laughs> thank you. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Pallone, the full committee chairman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's been noted, Chairman Wheeler, that you've had the unique experience of leading um, both the FCC as well as some of the industries that now oppose strong net neutrality. And as you know, when Chairman Pai sought to repeal the 2015 net neutrality protections, he did so citing the potential for increased broadband investment. And now we hear investment went down after Chairman Pai's order was adopted. So I have two questions. The first one is, can you explain what's going on here? Was the 2015 order as bad for the Internet service providers as they claim? Uh, well, I think the uh, evidence of that is no, uh, in a word. Um, and uh, investment um, has uh, investment increased in the two years following the Open Internet order, uh, as opposed to the two years preceding the Open Internet order. 
All right, well, let me ask you my second question. Some internet service providers claim they don't oppose net neutrality protections that would stop blocking, throttling, or paid prioritization. But I worry, and I know Chairman Doyle has expressed this, about the threats to an open internet that we haven't anticipated. Rules like the general conduct standard that you included in 2015 rules and that Governor Murphy of New Jersey included in his executive order recently are aimed at providing a regulator the flexibility to protect consumers from new threats or unanticipated threats. With that in mind, why is it important to have strong federal protections like the general conduct standard or protections for interconnection? Thank you, Congressman. The, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that um, saying I am for an open internet, I'm just not for the common carrier rules is kind of like saying I'm for justice, just not for the courts overseeing it. Um, one of the, wh the reason that I was saying to Mr. Ladder that I agree with my friend Michael and the leadership that he showed with his four principles, and there is a huge difference between his four principles as chairman and the advocacy that you're hearing today. The four principles are just that. They're principles. They're broad. They cover a multitude of topics. Blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization, that's it. And as I said in my, in my opening statement, what that means is you're free to do whatever you want in discriminating so long as you say, well, it's not blocking, it's not throttling, it's not paid prioritization. We do not know what the internet is going to be. And we can't sit here and make Netflix era decisions that we, we assume uh, will apply tomorrow. The nature of the internet has changed since Michael did his four points, and it's gonna change again tomorrow. And our challenge is how do we make sure that the public interest is represented in that change? Well, thank you. Now, I want to ask one more question of Ms. Gonzalez. I'm concerned that the FCC ran a flawed process leading up to the repeal of net neutrality, specifically by ignoring thousands of consumer complaints and allowing millions of fake comments with stolen identities flood the docket. And I'm, I'm worried that the proceeding is tainted. So, Ms. Gonzalez, in your view, was the FCC's repeal of net neutrality tainted, and does that put the repeal on shaky ground, in your opinion? Yes, and we actually covered this in our um, our petition for uh, our, uh, our brief in the net neutrality case where we're a party. Um, the process seemed to be guided by all ideology and not facts right from the outset. And in announcing his efforts to begin the repeal process, Chairman Pai said, this is a fight that I'm gonna win. And it, it appeared that that skewed sort of the approach of the commission. Uh, you mentioned uh, thousands of um, potentially fraudulent comments in the docket that the FCC failed to investigate and just went ahead and rushed forward to a final order without truly vetting what was happening in the democratic process, uh, rulemaking process. Uh, the electronic comment filing system that allows the public to weigh in went down the same night that John Oliver covered net neutrality on his uh, uh, show. And thousands of net neutrality complaints that had been filed by consumers with the net neutrality ombudsperson were not put on the record. The only reason we ever heard about them was that in National Hispanic Media Coalition filed a requ FOIA request and analyzed those documents and found that um, what they showed was that people, the public, understand broadband internet access as a telecommunication service. So I too share your concern that uh, it was a flawed process and that it puts it on shaky ground. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Walden, the full committee ranking member, for five minutes to ask questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank again all the witnesses. Mr. Fresnel, according to Ms. Gonzalez's uh, testimony, and I quote, ISP's own deployment investment data show the Title II reinvestment uh, reinstatement and, and the 2015 net neutrality rules did not slow down deployment sp speed upgrades or overall investment by ISPs. And, and she's relying on her, her own figures or the organizations or wherever you, you got the data. I'm not questioning that, but what I want to know is, Mr. Fresnel, from your standpoint as somebody on the ground doing build-out, what did you see during this period? 
Thank you, uh, Congressman Walden. So, uh, it, you know, it's interesting because I've, I've, I've read the U.S. Telecom report on investment, and it shows a different or tells a different story than what I'm hearing here today. And so I, I, I don't know which set of numbers is right. All I can talk about is what things look like for Eastern Oregon Telecom trying to bridge the, the digital divide, doing the work in these very remote areas. And when I say remote, it's a different definition than what we have in the East. And, and I grew up a lot out here, so I, I know the difference between East and West. And uh, we're, you know, we're talking about uh, frontier areas and how do we serve those folks. And so as the discussion about applying uh, Title II and net neutrality rules. And again, the, the, big, the biggest issue for Eastern Oregon Telecom has been Title II, not, not fairness Why? of the inter two I, uh, internet. Uh, but w I could not get loans from a bank during the net neutrality debate and during the net neutrality period. It was only as we started to hear the commitment from the new FCC to repeal Title II that we started to see the cash uh, open up and right. availability and and quite frankly for more than a year I never got an offer from a single equity investor now I I get them weekly almost and investment cash flow is has been freed up so there had at least from my perspective there was a dramatic impact and it's changed thank you uh, Chairman Powell Mr Powell a um, couple of things one uh, we heard how Title II wasn't all that bad because so many of its provisions were forbeared by the then uh, Wheeler FCC. Could another FCC change its mind in terms of what would be uh, forborne or not? I believe so. It's a discretionary act of the commission. Would that require a full rulemaking to determine that, or could a chairman do it? Um, I think it would require a full commission vote. But they could yeah. do it on their own. Does that create uncertainty? going forward? Well, obviously it does. I mean, I think we could play a game about how many rules get forborne from, but what's important to remember is um, it's not the volume, it's which rules got forborne mm -hmm. and which ones don't. Rules that didn't get inborn, uh, forborne from do allow uh, for lawsuits and challenges to rate-making proceedings. Uh, it allows the Commission to opine on all terms and conditions of service to determine whether they are, quote, just and reasonable. Um, almost all powerful net neutrality, I mean, I mean, all powerful Title II rules are derived from Section 201 and 202, uh, which remain in force. So would, is it possible under Title II that phone traffic on the Internet could be subject to um, fees like USF? Well, in fact, under the USF statutes, um, if you are a telecommunications service provider, it is mandatory under congressional law uh, that you charge contribution factors to internet service. So to put this more simply, consumers on the broadband internet today or for the last you know, 20 years have not seen that morass of phone charges, uh, taxes and fees that you see on a typical phone bill. Uh, but once an internet become, information service becomes a telecom service, there's an argument that the statute requires those same fees and charges uh, go on to an internet bill, which means a consumer's bill would go up. So one of the issues I know some groups raised with me uh, last year, I think it was the realtors, very concerned about what they saw as paid prioritization, net neutrality, but what they were really talking about was more insurgence of some of the search engines mm -hmm. and how you could buy rankings. They were afraid their competitors were, were being ranked up. Do you think these net neutrality provisions we're debating here should apply to the edge providers? Well, I do. I've always been stunned at the lack of comparison between the alleged behavior of ISPs with regard to neutrality and the actual demonstrable behavior of edge providers with regard to the same principles. It seems to me just this week we learned about Apple blocking Facebook applications in its store. Just this week we learned of Twitter blocking uh, speakers who they disagree with. All those companies have subjective policies that determine who they allow <coughs> to speak on their platforms and who don't. Uh, Facebook prioritizes news feeds at its choice. Um, uh, Google has a very profitable business model of allowing people to pay uh, for who gets seen in search results higher than others. Um, it's a hollow promise to consumers to say that uh, we're going to guarantee you a world of neutral access uh, when all the destinations that you attend 
are engaging in the very practices that we say are supposedly so heinous if they are enacted by an ISP. So at best, we're talking, we're having a very incomplete conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Mr. McNerney from California. Yes. Um, I thank the chairman and I, I thank the witnesses for your testimony this morning. <clears throat> um, no, the truth is, my constituents care deeply about net neutrality. Just last March, more than 150 of my constituents attended a town hall meeting to, to uh, voice their concerns. The way the FCC has handled this proceeding makes me question whether the agency even cared to hear my constituents' concerns and the concerns of millions of Americans who voiced their opposition. From the agency's failure to respond to my repeated requests regarding fabricated DDoS attacks, to its failure to respond to FOIA requests, and its failure to make thousands of submitted comments part of the record, there are major questions about how the proceedings were handled. In fact, FCC Commissioner Rosenworcel has accused her own agency of hiding information. Chairman Wheeler, sure. briefly, please, <laughs> would you make... We've been <laughs> hanging around too long. <laughs> <laughs> what would you make of how the agency handled the proceedings, and is this any way to run the show? No. That's brief. Thank you. <laughs> More than 9.6 million identities were stolen and used to file fake comments in this proceeding. About 26,000 of those are my constituents' identities. It's my understanding that these actions are now being investigated <coughs> by federal and state law enforcement agencies, and it's been publicly reported that Broadband for America and Free Press subpoenas a, a part of this investigation. Chairman Powell, uh, what is uh, the NCTA's relationship with Broadband for America? We're a member of it. Does Broadband Ameri for America still exist? Yes. Is Broadband for America complying uh, or its former representatives complying with subpoenas and document requests for the investigation? Yes, my understanding they are. Good. Did the NCTA uh, ever engage Broadband for America to, to submit fake comments using stolen identities in this proceedings? Absolutely not. Okay, well, um, We'll, we'll be looking into that, um, Mr. Powell. Welcome. Uh, Ms. Gonzalez and Mr. Powell, did either of your organizations, consultants, or members pay for fake comments using stolen identities to be considered to the docket, Ms. Gonzalez? No, sir, absolutely not. Chairman Powell? No, sir. Thank you. Ms. Gonzalez, my home state of California is prone to a number of natural disasters from devastating wildfires to floods and earthquakes. During times of emergency and in the weeks and months that follow, people immediately rush to the web to check evacuation routes to see if their loved ones are safe and to find out if it's even safe to breathe outside. Ms. Gonzalez, if some information sources are taking priority because they paid for it and are unrelated to safety information people are trying to access in these circumstances, how might people's access to such information be affected? I think, uh, you know, it's long been the consideration of this committee and, and the FCC that public safety is one of, if not the most important job that we have to do. And we want to make sure that the commission has the full authority to ensure that consumers are protected in those times. Thank you. Um, Ms. Olivier, um, you gave a few examples of how uh, open access was critical to establish uh, artistic talent. Uh, was the example list you gave exhaustive, or is it the tip of the iceberg? That's the tip of the iceberg. Okay, and so you could give other examples if we ask for that? Yes, sir. Okay, I might be uh, asking you to, to submit a list, if you would, of, of examples. I of would that. be happy Thank to. Ms. Dixon, I understand that some smaller ISPs, including <laughs> Sonic, which serves many of my constituents, raise concerns in a letter to the FCC that Chairman Pai's order would threaten their ability to interconnect with the larger ISPs. I would like to introduce a letter for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, so ordered. Ms. Dixon, can you explain the risks to consumers now that the FCC no longer has a framework to address interconnection complaints? It just creates the same issue. It puts the power in the hands of the larger ISPs 
It puts the power in their hands to, to work with the largest companies on the web, the largest companies in the world, and leaves all the small businesses uh, to, to have to wait and try to get the, the, the leftovers and the back and to go behind it. The interconnection agreements are a very important part of what the FCC needs to continue to regulate. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from the great state of California. <laughs> Chair now recognizes Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Five Chairman. Minutes. First, I want to make sure we know, we recognize Marsha Latta, who's observing her husband's ascension to the uh, leader of the telecom subcommittee. And he didn't do that. We usually forget our spouses in public speaking and engagements. So <laughs> I've learned that that's a bad mistake. Um, uh, secondly, to the new members of the subcommittee, this is why this is a great full committee, and this is why this subcommittee, I mean, we've got really very articulate experts who are trying to wrestle with an issue. As my, as the chairman of the full committee has reminded me numerous times, um, uh, if we want, if, if, you know, we could have messaging fights, and we'll have those, or we could pass laws. And when, when um, we were in the majority, I, I learned from that because when I had to pass things through my subcommittee, I had to have reach for that bipartisan compromise. If we wanted to pass a law, if we want to have this fight and pull our hair out, I taught high school. For a bill to become a law, the president has to sign it. He's not going to sign this. So I think... What our attempt is to say is, where do we go to the middle? Where do we address these real problems? Now, I, I uh, sympathize a lot with Mr. Fresnel because I represent 14,000 square miles in southern Illinois. Uh, and, and Ms. Dixon, Mozilla is a f foundation. Does that mean it's a not-for-profit? We are owned by a non-for-profit. Yeah. So a lot of my communication providers are not-for-profits, just like in districts like Mr. Fresnel. We're there, we're, I understand that approach to small business. Our approach to small businesses, those small businesses in towns that don't even have access yet. And Chairman Wheeler or Chairman Powell know that I've been focused all on my life about mapping. Let's find out where we have service and where we don't. Yes. And then where do we find out how fast that service is? So that when we have this, these battles, Anna, you, do you want time? Okay, I, I, I thought you were trying to, I thought you were. So, um, so if we're going to be involved, how can we help get that full build out? It would be helpful to everybody. So I've always been focused in this debate about how do you build out? How do you get the fiber into the ground? And I, I'm not as smart as y'all, um, but I know that that's private sector dollars that do that. And there's got to be an incentive for them to lay the fiber. And fiber is a lot better than coaxial cable. And there's more information going out. So I, I would hope and I would plead that, that we eventually get through the, the emotion, which I'm not discounting, and we, we focus on fixing this problem. Because if, if I finally get my small businesses connected in Gallatin County, uh, old Shawnee Town, right, they're going to want to have full access. But I've got to get them access first. Otherwise, it's kind of a moot point to, to, to some of us who represent rural areas. So I, I, don't, I, don't, I, hope we, I just hope we get there. Um, you know, we're having this big fight on border security. <clears throat> and one of the responses is wall fencing and some is smart technology. Now, uh, the southern border, as you probably all know fairly well, is pretty rural. <coughs> and if you're going to use drones, I mean, and this is a Demo one of the Democrat responses is let's do smart technology, let's do drones, let's do technology, let's cameras and let's see who's coming. Um, that'll require a lot of investment, a lot of build out. Would there, should, if there's information of a 
child trafficking, uh, fentanyl being pushed across the border. Um, is there any role for anyone to prioritize information? If we want our border security guys to go and stop a coyote bringing across child trafficking, sh sh and, and that information is trying to get to the operation, the tactical operations center, former military guy like Mr. Powell, should that be prioritized? And I guess my time's expired and I don't, it's, it's your call, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Powell wants to answer that briefly. I'll give him the opportunity, but was, was there a question in there? <laughs> yeah, we need to build more fiber. <laughs> Do you guys have to mention the wall at every hearing? <laughs> I didn't yesterday. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, I'll just take advantage of the opportunity to say. Briefly. You know, when I was chairman, I was a huge champion of public safety, and I think it's a perfect example of why we should be careful about what we mean about no prior prioritization. There are societal uses that we will all agree should enjoy a higher priority over other uses. It's true in every tangible part of the economy. I don't know why we think it wouldn't be true in the digital space. But there's just one thing that you left out, though. Yeah. The 2015 rule allowed for that kind of prioritization. Mr. Shimkus and I started working 20 years ago, probably longer than that, on public safety issues. <clears throat> And we, and we allowed, we, we made sure that the 2015 rule allowed for that kind of priorities. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes the vice chair of the pool committee, uh, Ms. Clark. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member, and I thank all of our expert panelists for bringing your expertise to the table today. And I say good afternoon. I'm glad that we're having this hearing, and, it's, and we've decided to kick it off this week with a hearing on net neutrality. This issue is a major concern for my constituents in the state of New York. In fact, Governor Cuomo signed an executive order to keep the net neutrality rules in place post FCC repeal. Additionally, former New York Attorney General Barbara Underwood led a lawsuit with 22 other attorney generals to reinstate the 2015 open internet rules and led an investigation into fraudulent net neutrality comments. So along the lines of uh, Mr. McNearney of California, uh, I'd like to just ask a couple of things. Uh, well, first I wanna highlight a few things. The voices uh, that the FCC ignored in 2017, those like Brooklyn's own Take Shape and, state, and staff base and millions of other small businesses across the country whose existence depends on a free and open internet. And uh, our, the irony of, of millions of Americans that took the time to write the FCC opposing the repeal of net neutrality and they literally broke uh, the public comment records doing it, yet their voices went unheard. So Chairman Wheeler, can you explain why so many small businesses oppose the gutting of the 2015 net neutrality protections. I, I think that we need to have that in context. Um, and, and you know, even when we talk about rural communities, the idea at the end of the day is to get us to a broadband ubiquity, but what does this mean for, for small businesses? Thank you very much, Ms. Clark. Um, if a business cannot get to its consumers, it does not have a business, and the network that connects us all in the 21st century is the internet. Um, I remember a time um, when I was in um, Eastern Kentucky meeting with coal miners who were learning to code mm -hmm. because they'd lost their mining jobs. But I also met <coughs> with a young man who had a guitar shop a guitar shop in Pikesville, uh, uh, um, Kentucky. When the bottom fell out of the coal economy, the bottom fell out of his guitar shop, but he went on the internet and started selling guitars on the internet, and he is now a bigger business in Pikesville today than he was when he was not. If you can't get to your customers, you don't have a business, and the internet is how you get to your customers. Very well. Uh, Ms. Livier, uh, your testimony discussed how in your line of work, 
lots of jobs are being migrated to the digital space and how this is an opening opportunity for people of color. How do small companies and entrepreneurs alike end up on the losing end in a 21st century economy <coughs> without open internet protections? There's a series of ways in that you lose out, right? From my um, experience as an actress and as a creative person, how are people going to find you online if somebody has a faster lane than you do? So they're gonna win out in order to like reach a client. Um, I do, for example, voice work. And if I record it on my laptop at home and I send it in to my client, but if my connection is slow, then that's gonna cause uh, a problem. So for an independent like me and folks like me, it's, it's really important to have an open um, internet so that's an even playing field. Otherwise, we can't, we can't compete. We, we don't have the, the, the pocketbooks to pay for, for, for access and it, that shouldn't be the case. Absolutely. The, thank you for your, for your response. Ms. Gonzalez, anything you'd like, you'd like to add on that? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of research out there, Congresswoman, about um, how people use the internet and what even a couple of seconds of delay does turns people away to different sites. So uh, if I'm an independent creator or if I'm like my friend Vanessa who runs her own blog, she's two rows behind me with her nine-year-old daughter today, mm -hmm. uh, and my site is slightly slower than other content produced by, um, by mainstream media, some of whom also own the pipes. Comcast owns NBC Universal. They're producing content that competes with Vanessa's content. She'll, she'll tell you herself, she can't pay to go faster to access audience. And even a few seconds of delay, people, are, people want it now. We're in a rapid, uh, rapid economy, rapid expectations about how we are delivered our content. And it really ha would hamper competition and her ability to run her own business, reach an audience, earn a living. Very well. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, in 2014, interconnection disputes involving edge providers, backbone companies, and the last mile ISPs resulted in Netflix video service being degraded for some, con oh, I'm sorry. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank I you. I didn't realize the time. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Olson from the great state of Texas. I Five thank minutes. the chair and congratulations on your having the gavel for the 116th Congress. Here we go again. Or as the New York Yankee sage of wisdom, Yogi Berra said, deja, deja vu all over again. It doesn't matter if a Democrat is in the White House, a Republican in the White House, a Democrat speaker, or Republican speaker. We fight, fight, and we fight, and do nothing about net neutrality. And our inaction has forced agencies like the FCC administration to try to fill the void. And that's sad, because as Chairman Latta mentions opening statements, we have so much in common, so much common ground. For example, the title of this hearing, Preserving an open internet for consumers. Yes. Small business. Yes. And free speech. Double yes. And then, spirit of bipartisanship, the donkey, elephant in the room, Title II. And that's what this whole thing breaks down because, as Mr. Latta mentioned, Title II is based on the phone of Alexander Graham Bell right over there. And sadly, instead of working together as neighbors and friends and solve this problem once and for all, we keep going down this road over and over and over. My first questions are for you, Mr. Farnell and Chairman Powell. In y'all's testimony, well, most, most of you, Mr. Farrell, your testimony provided an in-depth analysis of how Title II regulations would harm small ISPs. I was hoping you could expand on how shifting away from 20 years of previous precedent of being regulated under Title I would affect small ISPs such as yours. 
Thank you for the question. And uh, for the record, I, I graduated from high school and college in Texas. So thank you very much for uh, the stars uh, at night. <laughs> and uh, so the, the reality of my world is, uh, and Eastern Oregon Telecom has been around for almost 20 years. Um, in those 20 years, and, and we were created to provide advanced telecommunications in a market where the incumbent was not doing their job. And, uh, and today, that is still true. So in the, the markets that we serve, Eastern Oregon Telecom, a non-regulated competitive carrier who takes no federal dollars, no state dollars, uh, is providing 100 meg service or gigabit service to the communities that we serve while the incumbent is still struggling to provide 10-1. Um, so we're doing that in an area that on the interstate takes about an hour to drive going 70 if you're driving the speed limit from one end to the other and, and crosses into the Washington border. We do that with 19 employees. Wow. Every dollar that we've made since we started has been reinvested in the company. There's not been a single distribution, even for taxes, to the owners, of which I'm one. So the tax thing is painful, by the way. So even as a non-regulated ISP, there are reporting requirements. I still have to report the 470, 499, all of those reporting requirements to the FCC that helps with the mapping, even though it's, it's not accurate, it's it's still a problem. You know, we're, we're still doing our part. I probably am applying, between the state and the federal requirements, I probably have a third full-time equivalent right now dedicated to regulatory reporting. <coughs> now, to put that in perspective, every fixed wireless tower that I put up, I can put up and activate for about $10,000. And each one of those towers can serve a community or about 500 addresses. So if I'm, if I'm paying full bore for a third full-time equivalent, that means I'm probably not expanding my infrastructure by some percentage every year. If you add a layer to that or layers to that, then I, I can't keep up and I can't continue to expand the network. So basically, if it's under Title II, your small business gets hit hard and over time, fades away, fades away, and eventually it's gone. Or at, at, at a bare minimum is no longer able to continue it, to expand and serve unserved or underserved communities in the rural remote areas of Eastern Oregon and Eastern Oregon. No new jobs, no new revenue, no new equipment, no growth, no growth, no growth. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, we now recognize uh, Mr. Lobsack for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Doyle and Ranking Member Latta. Really happy that we've got a good team there leading this committee. Uh, I am a little concerned if I'm going to have to keep uh, following Mr. Olson every time, uh, given that we're up here on the top. But, but we've worked together on things, and thank you so much. Yeah, we're, we're okay with Navy. That's right. Thank you. A um, lot, lot of great people here on the panel, a lot of uh, great issues uh, that we've discussed. Um, I've, worked, I've worked with a number of folks on the other side of the aisle since I got on this committee on a number of these issues. And I do want to thank you, Mr. Fresnel, for being here because we have over 100 uh, companies like yours in the state of Iowa. My district is about the size of Shimka, so it's maybe not quite as big. Walden reminds us all the time that his district's bigger than my state. So um, I understand the issues in, in rural America. Uh, but I worked with, with Congressman Walden to try to re reduce some of those regulatory burdens on folks like you when I first got on this committee four years ago. Um, I worked with uh, Congressman Latta on precision agriculture. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, and uh, worked with uh, former Congressman Costello on the mapping issue. I'm going to get to that in a second, too. Uh, I have some faith, how much I don't know, but uh, some faith that we can arrive at some kind of uh, bipartisan solutions to these issues. And I'm looking over here at Gianforte. He's like, why am I not talking about him? Because we work together on EMS issues uh, as well, the last Congress. Um, and I appreciate that, Greg. Um, I talk all the time about rural broadband. That's my thing. It has to be given the people I represent in the second district of Iowa. Uh, and, and, you know, we've got to do everything we can uh, to make sure that the, the quality of service is there and we are able to build out going forward. Uh, I was going to ask a small business question, but that's kind of been dealt with. I do want to go right to precision agriculture, the growing importance of connectivity. 
uh, in agriculture. How important, I want to ask uh, Mr. Wheeler this question, how important do you think the open internet order protections are for advancing smart and connected agriculture? What threats do you see for precision agriculture if these principles are not in place? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, you know, it's interesting to watch how technology, and you watch it far more closely than I do, but how technology has changed the nature of the ag agricultural activity. Um, and, um, you know, the day when um, you had a GPS to your tractor changed productivity for agriculture in a huge way. We are now moving to a period where fifth generation and next generation broadband services are going to be able to put out into the field things that we haven't even imagined any more than we imagined the GPS to the tractor those years ago. The reality, however, is that somebody is going to control whether or not that capability gets to that mm -hmm. field. Right. And, um, and when you say, well, we're only going to do blocking, throttling, and prioritization, then you say everything else that I can do to advantage myself as the provider of the service can be done. Mm -hmm. And so what a key component of the 2015 order was, was how do we maintain flexibility to take a look at what happens, what, what, what we don't know is going to happen, but we know will happen. That's an essence, of, a key essence of how you, you deal with maintaining, not just having an open internet today, right. but maintaining Thank an you. open internet tomorrow. Thank you. I want to move on to the mapping issue. Um, we've got a, uh, an REC in my district, Sheraton Valley, Rural mm -hmm. Electric Cooperative, uh, and they're trying their best. They've tried every which way uh, to get the FCC to allow them to provide uh, broadband service to their service area. But the mapping as it now exists uh, doesn't allow them because it says that there's a lot more coverage there than there in fact is. And as I said, I worked with, with uh, uh, Ryan Costello on a bill on that. The FCC is supposed to be coming up with better maps as we speak, but it depends upon the data that they're using, obviously. And I guess I want to ask both the former chairman, starting with you, uh, Chairman Powell, how the heck are we going to deal with this? I mean, Shimkus brought this up. You know, this is something that, that we're just fighting with all the time, and especially to make sure that we get people who want to provide that service who might not be an incumbent carrier. They're not even a telco. It's an REC. How do we get that to that point? Well, I think you've all been very articulate about the, es the essential essence and importance of, of mapping, and I know uh, you, you directed and the Commission is working hard to improve the map, so hopefully we will we will get an improvement on that. Specifically, uh, with respect to the circumstances of, of your company and constituent, I would um, recommend to them there is a process in place at the FCC to challenge and appeal uh, the current mapping to be able to demonstrate to the Commission that an area that they show as underserved or unserved uh, is, is in fact unserved. Right. Right. Uh, and, I, and I'm sure that they've been counseled and are pursuing that process. So I think that's very, very important to them. Thank you, and I know my time has expired. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for letting me go. And Mr. Wheeler, if you'd get back to us on that, I'd appreciate well, we're it. We're also whispering back and forth here. We agree. Yeah. Thank you. How's okay. that for a short answer? I thank the gentleman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, uh, we'll now recognize Mr. Bill Arrakis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, Mr. Chairman. I want to con congratulate the ranking member as well. Uh, and also, thank you for the, the bold uh, name t t uh, plates, because uh, I've always had a difficult time seeing the, the name plates and identifying <laughs> you know, the witnesses, so I appreciate that very much. Uh, again, at first I want to acknowledge that we need to protect users from any blocking and throttling of service that uh, th threaten freedom of thought and consumer choice on Internet services. At the same time, I do not want to subject the Internet ecosystem to a system of heavy-handed agency control regardless of the administration in charge. This, too, will lead to limitations on consumer choice and limits on broadband deployment. Since the 2008-2009 recession, private broad, 
broadband spending increased year over year, except during the period of time Title II scheme was in place. And in October 15, 2009 letter to the FCC, 72 Democrat members agreed that the commission should, and I quote, carefully consider the full range of potential consequences that government action may have on network investment, unquote, and urged against government regulation. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, submit the October 15th letter, 2009 letter, uh, into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Thank you sir. I, I have a couple questions. Uh, Mr. Fresnel, uh, in the absence of a federal solution, how does the prospect of state patchwork legislation impact any interests you may have in expanding services and creating competition just north of you uh, to Washington State and beyond? Congressman, thank you for the, the question. So we currently do provide internet service across the river. Uh, we serve some wineries, so you should come visit, and, uh, and some large uh, farms. We also serve a small community that's right on the river on the Washington side. And uh, you know, anytime there are cross-border jurisdictional differences in regulations, it creates a, a, you know, a layer of, first of all, uncertainty. We're, okay, well, what's different in Washington than in Oregon? Washington's got a net neutrality law. Oregon's got a net neutrality law. They're different. How do we manage that? Now, it, it, it's less of a problem for us because our goal is not making money by manipulating things. Our goal is to transform rural Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington, and perhaps other areas uh, with broadband. And so that's our focus. So, you know, this, this other discussion about manipulation and all that, uh, that, that doesn't even fit into our culture as a company. But uh, anything that makes things more complex, you know, it, it slows us down. It adds a layer of, of uh, uncertainty when we're dealing with different regulatory environments. And so I would prefer to see a national standard for this. And, and again, at light touch, I'm I'm not absolutely advocating for Title II. I think that that's a bad idea. But there, legislation from the federal government solves this uncertainty. As we look at other states in the West, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, and expanding in those areas, knowing what the, the, the playing field is the same would provide us a lot of confidence. Ha not having that creates uncertainty and, and makes us hesitant to expand in those areas. I hope that answers. All right, thank you very much for the input. Uh, also, uh, again, for you, Mr. Fresnel, uh, for the most part, a business survives on maintaining a good relationship with its cu customers, obviously. How has the public misunderstanding of the 2015 uh, order impacted the relationship you have with your customers, despite your business not engaging in anti-competitive acts? It was actually quite disturbing how angry people got over the topic of net neutrality. And, and when I talked about the, the un inability to have a conversation about this that was rational, I started talking early on about some of my concerns about net neutrality in the local newspaper in the East Oregonian. And, um, and the feedback was visceral and uh, irrational. Uh, and, and I think it was driven off of fear. So people were afraid that even though we clearly stated up front that we don't manipulate traffic, we just, that's not who we are, yeah. um, that they just were suddenly fearful and distrustful of all ISPs and somehow it became an evil entity. And so it was, it was disturbing because our business is built on relationships. What about now? Are you still getting that? I, we'll see extent? when I get home after this hearing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good, good answer. Good answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. McKeegan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for the leadership that you're demonstrating on this issue and, and the leadership that you're providing this, uh, this committee. I'm going to start off by apologizing to my staff who worked so diligently on questions last night, um, but I'm going to call them audible and go off in a little bit of a different direction. Um, Mr. Fresnel. I am a uh, recovering trial lawyer, and Bless as your heart, uh, sir. <laughs> thank you, and as such, I am uh, awfully impressed by analogies, and I'm awfully impressed by uh, what I would call stare decisis. And Mr. Wheeler has taken us back on a journey of 600 years of common law tradition, um, where he tells us that the ferryman in England uh, 
couldn't discriminate as he took people across the river. That has a certain appeal to me because at the end of the day, aren't you just a ferryman who's taking me from one part of the internet to another? Yes, sir, and that's why we don't discriminate with traffic. Well, and I, I heard you give some, uh, uh, some um, support for the notion of a legislative scheme coming from Washington uh, that ensures that. What would that look like if it's not Title II? Well, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not an attorney and I'm not a legislator. I'm a, well, we I'm a small you for businessman. That. But I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, think that, uh, I think that we need to first define what is our desired end state, and it's a free and open Internet, uh, unencumbered by interference, especially non-competitive, uh, from any provider, whether it be the ISP. We focus so much on ISPs, but rightly so. A lot of this discussion has to revolve around the, the, the browsers, the end users, the edge. You know, the, those are the folks that today are actually engaging that more often than the ISP. Most of the ISPs that I know, that, that's not our business model, and so we don't do that. And so I think we have to figure out a way to address that issue to, to create clear boundaries on behavior so that when people, in, an end user like myself goes on the internet, I have confidence that I'm gonna get where I wanna go without somebody interfering. Now I did talk about prioritization and I think prioritization is, is I shouldn't be deciding on prioritization, society should be pr deciding on prioritization. We've talked about public safety an awful lot and how they need prioritization. That is at the heart of the first net network that we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on. It may be in the, with the big B. Uh, I can't remember the amount where it's this nationwide interoperable network that provides pr prioritization for public safety. That solves a lot of that problem. But you know that's a national decision. That's not me making that decision. Although I would love to be able to prioritize every 911 call that goes across a county line and it's a long distance call. I think that should just always be first. But I, you know, Title II and, and net neutrality says, Joe, you ought to just stay out of that because somebody's gonna yell at you, somebody's gonna get upset with you, you're gonna end up in front of Congress and here I am. <laughs> Mr. Wheeler, uh, I am uh, in my second term in Congress and uh, new to these discussions, so I urge you and perhaps your friend Mr. Powell to write a book called um, Net Neutrality for Dummies. It should be in the <laughs> yellow cover and that sort of thing. But, in, but until you get a chance to do that, can you comment on what Mr. Fresnel said and tell me where the pitfalls might be? Or maybe you agree with everything he said. So, um, you know, I think, thank goodness for the Fresnels and the Eastern Oregon uh, telecom of the world because delivering to uh, rural America is, is, is an essential. Several things. One, the laundry list that he went through in terms of the kind of forms he has to file and has to hire this person to do, um, most of those are not a result of the open internet order. They deal, for instance, with the mapping question <laughs> that we all talked about. They deal with other issues that the FCC needs to collect information on. Uh, number two, um, prioritization for public safety activities is specifically allowed for under the 2015 Act. Um, and, and point three, sir, it's not just the firefighters or the policemen who ought to have the, uh, who, who are affected by the lack of an of a open internet, but it's also the people who are the victims of those emergencies who themselves um, need to get online and are experiencing the same blocking or throttling realities, and as a result of the decision of the Trump FCC, have nowhere to go, because that is not an unfair or deceptive act or practice so long as you say, I'm going to be doing that. And so there is no place to go. We need to make sure that we have open networks and an open network includes openness and prioritization for basic and essential public services. Thank you, my time's expired, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McEachin, and I apologize for keep butchering your name. <laughs> I think I got it right now. The chair uh, recognizes, do we know? 
Yeah. Uh, Billy, you're recognized for five minutes. The am great I, state am of I Missouri. That forgettable? <laughs> I, I just couldn't see you over there, Billy. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm a little guy. <laughs> oh, well, welcome to this round of Double Jeopardy. And uh, today in Double Jeopardy, just like all Jeopardy shows, you need to form your answer in the form of a question. So if I were to show you Mike Pence, you would say, who is the Vice President? All right, Ms. Gonzalez, you're up. First round. Who is this? Uh, who is Mr. Boehner? <laughs> who, who, uh, kind of close. Who is Speaker Boehner? Thank you. And there's $45 for each correct question. I have your All right. $45 up there. <laughs> and next we have Mr. Powell. Mr. Wheeler, would you not bother the witness? I'm trying to <laughs> communicate here. Next we have Mr. Powell. And Mr. Powell, the question or the uh, Answer, you need to ask the question, but the answer is? Who is Speaker Pelosi? Very good, very good. You get $45. And Mr. Wheeler, you are adept at history, as you have proven here today. And I know that you're a great historian. I am so, terrified and I, the picture that's coming up. <laughs> you know, right. I've already given you your $45, as you, <laughs> as you were trying to show uh, Mr. Powell there. So I have great faith that you know, you know the answer to this. And so... The question, I guess the, this is the answer. Oh, oh You're wait a minute. The question. Uh, Correct. That is. <laughs> that, that is John Sherman, is it not? No? Who is it? I'll get my 45 bucks back. Okay. You get <laughs> now, uh, this is Henry Speaker. Excuse me. I'm doing Mrs. Miss Gonzalez's trick. Uh, who is Speaker Henry Thomas Rainey? He was Speaker of the House when Title II passed Congress in 1934. A wise man. And I think even Speaker Rainey would admit that a bill passed should not be governed, that he passed should not be governing this century's Internet. So, question for Mr. Powell. Mr. Powell, if we all agree that the 21st century Congress should establish, establish ba basic net neutrality rules, can't we solve the problem by putting them under new authority and not use a set of rules passed by the very distinguished Speaker Rainey? Uh, most certainly. You know, it's, it's a little frustrating to, to hear people um, cite certain virtues of certain elements of Title II, which certainly could be in some form or the other written into anything new and organic, um, without considering the millions of pages of things that aren't considered that would also automatically apply. It's the difference between should you dump a mountain of regulations on a new and emerging service and hope you can whittle away at it to make it optimal, or should you write from a clean sheet of paper up in order to tailor it to the circumstances that are affecting you? I've always believed that the internet is so dynamic, so different, so radically varied from the telephone system uh, that any thoughtful effort to write regulations with respect to its oversight um, should be done from the ground up, um, not from the historical mountain down. And so. Um, there are no limits to Congress's power. It can have rules strong, it can have enforcement strong, and, and it can create a sufficient amount of nimbleness to address unforeseen situations. Um, I think it's a red herring to suggest that only that body of law affords that possibility. Let me, let me move on to another question for you, Chairman Powell. We've seen a rise in the number of comments filed in response to policymaking proceedings at the FCC since your time as chairman. However, the underpinnings of the Administrative Procedure Act's legal re APA legal requirements involving the FCC's treatment of those comments remains largely the same as when you were the chairman. The APA requires agencies to consider all comments received, but does the APA require the FCC or administrative agency to verify the identity of a commenter before it can be considered? And in the spirit of John Dingle, that's a yes or no answer. Uh, no, it does not require that. Is the FCC under any legal obligation to adopt, to adopt identity verification procedures, yes or no? Not that I'm aware of. If the, public had to supply, if the public had to supply proof of identity before comment could be considered with the FCC, could the additional burdens not to mention forced public uh, be one of the beliefs impacted by the full and robust public participation of policymaking proceedings that have enjoyed? And I think that's probably yes. yes. Okay. Now, in my final 15 seconds here of Jeopardy, 
Uh, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record a report examining <coughs> the influence of the Obama administration over the Wheeler FCC's decision to go down the path of Title II. Without objection, so ordered. <coughs> Yield back my one second. I did it. <laughs> Thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Soto, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think we're developing a consensus that we do need to update the law a little bit. And I'm glad to hear at least that much agreement in the committee. You know, the Communications Act was from 1934 under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I won't. I don't have flashcards to show you all, but uh, radio and telephone were the ones that were covered at the time under Title II common carrier. And in uh, 1984, Congress did an amazing thing. We actually added another chapter, uh, chapter six on cable. Uh, that was 10 years before the World Wide Web was even born. Bell System was broke up at that time. Macintosh PCs and Dell computers were just launched. Mark Zuckerberg was born that year. People used pagers and cell phones the size of bricks, uh, costing thousands of dollars. So. I think we all understand it's time, right? Uh, the internet is not a fad. Uh, the FCC tried to legislate, but that's always gonna be ephemeral. Uh, it's always gonna be ping-ponging back and forth between administration. And so I think the most constructive thing we could do at our time is hear from everybody and develop a new chapter. Uh, it's time for Congress to act. It's time to have a new chapter covering the internet with new rules for the 21st century um, but I reject this being used as a stall tactic. It's time for a call for action for it rather than using this to just have more of the same for the next two years in this Congress. Um, but we need rules of the road for not only ISPs but content providers and others. Uh, there's a lot of folks that make up the internet. Uh, and so it'd be great to hear briefly one priority from each of you that w of what should be in that chapter and keep your remarks brief or I will unfortunately have to cut you off. We'll start with um, uh, Mr. Chairman Wheeler. A referee on the field with the ability to throw the flag for unjust and unreasonable activities. Okay, and Ms. Uh, Olivier? I'm gonna piggyback on that and have that uh, folks need to be held accountable and know that there's going to be some repercussions if they're not playing uh, fairly. And Mr. Powell. Um, I would endorse the original four freedoms that I sponsored with sufficient flexibility to address uh, unknown situations in the future. And Ms. Gonzalez. I'd support uh, legislation that adopts the full protections of the 2015 net neutrality order. And Mr. Dixon. Ms. Dixon. Oh, sorry, Ms. Dixon. I'm sorry, that says Mr. Dixon in our witness list. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Ms. Dixon, sorry I, about that. We would support uh, legislation that has flexibility for enforcement. The most important thing is making sure that <coughs> there's a cop on the beat. And uh, Mr. Fresnel. Thank you. I would, I would add that uh, all pieces of the internet be treated equally. So. Again, not this myopic focus on the ISP, but the whole internet, uh, so that the experience of the end user uh, is is equal across the, the the board. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your input. That's what we're really here for, um, to actually use this committee to hear testimony and develop a new chapter, uh, at least from my opinion, and uh, and I appreciate all your. Uh, advice on that as we're looking forward to working with everybody to develop actually a new chapter for the internet for the 21st century. So thank you for that and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, <clears throat> chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it and uh, congratulations on your, uh, on your gavel. Uh, I look forward to working with you this session. Um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Long submitted for the record the 2016 Senate report entitled Regulating the Internet, How the White House Bowled Over FCC Independence. Uh, this report documents how FCC staff were working on a net neutrality order that did not use Title II for consumer broadband right up until the moment President Obama announced support 
for Title II. Um, Chairman Wheeler, it's good to see you again. Sir. Um, you enjoying your retirement? It's a different life. It's a different life. Good. Well, you've stated publicly that Title II is the only legally sustainable way to protect net neutrality. Putting aside for the moment the fact that the D.C. Circuit gave the FCC a roadmap for adopting net neutrality without Title II, and your lead proposal for open Internet regulations relied on Title I, isn't it true that Congress can create new authority to protect net neutrality? Simple yes or no would be helpful. Well, I, I need to also respond to the aspersions that you have made about me and no, I, I didn't, making. I didn't no, make I, any they, aspersions. There, there have, I need an answer there have to been, the question. There, there have, we're not going to debate. There have been, there were, there were five hearings over nine days held by this body. So isn't it true that Congress can create come up new authority any. to protect net the neutrality? Congress always has the ability to do whatever they want. The question is. Okay, good. I appreciate what that. What are Mr. they Fernell. going to do? I, we're done. What's, we're done. What's the quality no, we're done. of the We're decision. done, Mr. Wheeler. We're done. I've asked my question to you, so now we're done. Mr. Fresnel, your written testimony states that since the repeal of net neutrality, investors have been <clears throat> much more willing and perhaps eager to invest in rural telecommunications. As I represent a rural district in eastern and southeastern Ohio, this is encouraging to hear. So do you think uh, the broadband market is more competitive or less competitive than it was four years ago? I think today, I think we're, we're seeing, and, and I can speak only to my area, so not, not the whole world broadband market, but the Pacific Northwest. I see more competition, uh, more robust competition, more effective competition. Uh, and I'm part of a, a group, Northwest Telecommunications Association, which is rural competitive carriers, so non-subsidized, non-incumbents. And, uh, and the, the work that's being done by them competing in markets where, again, the incumbents have failed to, to meet the needs of rural markets, I, I'm seeing more competition now uh, than I would. And it's not the last four years. I, again, you know, the, the cash is only really freed up over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. So that's when we've really seen the market, at least in the Pacific Northwest, <clears throat> start to really lift again. Okay. Uh, do you have any suggestions for the committee on how we can continue to improve the ability of ISPs to provide broadband, broadband Internet access to rural areas? So, wow, that's a big question, and we have a minute left. So, I, I, you know, I would say, first of all, find ways to encourage competition. Uh, find ways to uh, get the middle mile out to these rural areas, and then the ISPs like mine will, will take it from there. It's getting that long haul out into these rural markets. Uh, and, I mean, it's long distance is what we're talking about. Certainty is one of the big things. And so I love the idea of legislating this instead of being regulatory. Right. So if it's regulatory, it just every four years, it seems like it changes. And that's where the uncertainty comes in. Because, you know, we're talking about infrastructure that we're looking at you know, five or ten year ROI sometimes. And so to invest that money and not know that I'm going to have certainty, regulatory certainty, that, that I'm going to be able to actually pay the bills for that is really difficult. So this this is really encouraging to me that we're talking about legislating to solve this problem. So it's not just a regulatory thing that changes when the chair of the SEC changes. So I hope that answers that. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Chairman Powell, what, what's been the impact on uh, consumers over the past year of the FCC's restoring internet freedom order? Well, I think if anyone fairly goes home and uses their internet, they won't notice any material difference from any other time they use their internet, other than perhaps to notice that it's a lot faster than it was two or three, four, four years ago. Um, I would also highlight the fact that both the wireless industry and the cable industry have announced major monumental investments in new generation of networks. With wireless, you're hearing about 5G for the first time, uh, and new deployment announcements were made in 2018 and 2019. And at CES this year, the cable industry announced an initiative to move to 10 gigabits per second to the home over the course of the next several years, uh, which is a tenfold increase uh, of any speed available today. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. He yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. O'Halloran, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I thank you, the witnesses today, for uh, discussing this issue that uh, I've heard from so many Arizonans about uh, on a continual basis, an issue that has tremendous ramifications uh, for economic, economic opportunity and investment across rural America. My district, the American people, have spoken loudly and passionately about net neutrality. They've spoken out clearly in strong, supportive, and free and open internet, where winners and losers aren't predetermined and where practices like blocking and throttling have no place. I, too, support those principles and know how critical they are to ensuring every entrepreneur, every small business, every school and town across rural Arizona and America has a fair shot success in competing in today's and tomorrow's global marketplace. Hearing from my colleagues here today and across the aisle as well, it seems clear to me that uh, we stand uh, in broader agreement than was realized. We agree the internet must be remain open, that the rights of consumers be protected, and, and that innovation and entrepreneurship can thrive. As has been stated, the question now before us comes down to what we can do about it. Rural America needs a permanent, enforceable solution. We can't get that, the investments we need as long as the courts, other states, and this body all fight over a patchwork of rules. And so uh, I, th I think that Mr. Soto here uh, took some of my question away, but uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Wheeler and uh, uh, Chairman Wheeler and Chairman Powell the same question, and uh, we have a couple of minutes to get this done. Uh, if we had to waive the many uh, things under a Title II, why can't Congress write its new title? So I want to get right to the question that was proposed by a couple of people up here. In your experience, how do we stop the creation of a new title from becoming stalled? And how do we prioritize the, or identify the pitfalls that we're going to be going through if we go down that course? It's a great question, Congressman. Thank you. Um, first of all, we have to agree <clears throat> on what Title II means. <laughs> to my friend, Title II is a list of awfuls. Mm -hmm. To my friend Jessica, it's a list of positives. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we've got to figure out how to do this. On this panel, I might be unique because when I was running the Wireless Industry Association, my members came to me and said, we want you to go to Congress and have us made common carriers for precisely the reason that you said, we need uniformity of rules. And so this body passed legislation, created Section 332 of the Communications Act, which made wireless carriers at their request into common carriers. That was my aha moment as I was thinking, what do we do on an open internet rule? Because after that happened, two things, well, one thing happened was that the rules were modernized. The, 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 we, we went through and did the same kind of forbearance, okay? You did. <clears throat> and, and secondly, there were hundreds of billions of dollars that were spent after that on the basis of being a common carrier under Title II and having that kind of certainty which the industry sought. So I think you have put your finger on the key driving force, which is how do we have a national program and how does that national program adhere to the kind of concepts that have always been established in protections of Title II. So I want to give Mr. Powell. Or I would agree Powell. with much of what Mr. Wheeler said with a couple of really critical exceptions. Number one, I would note that he said Congress established a section making a public determination as to what the parameters of regulation for the wireless industry should be, not the FCC creating it itself out of a patchwork of laws available to it. Secondly, while um, wireless telephone service was regulated as a common carrier, wireless broadband service was not. And the thing that has driven the explosive growth of wireless in the last few years is with smartphones, apps, and broadband connectivity. Uh, ask your kids how many telephone calls uh, they make with their uh, Apple iPhone, and you'll see the difference. So I wouldn't classily assume 
uh, Title II is a competition empowering uh, a regime. In fact, uh, I think it's the regime favored by monopolists. And the reason why uh, nobody uh, wanted I, I have to cut you short. They didn't know. Because I got my four seconds to say the American people, our citizens, have the right to freedom of speech. They don't have that right if we do not allow them to be have free and open be access to these systems. Yes, sir. They have a right to be heard. Yes, sir. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes Mr. Wahlberg for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'd like to take uh, a point of personal privilege, uh, first of all, to express my love and care for uh, John and Debbie Dingell. Um, uh, John uh, really was the one who uh, gave me the enthusiasm about fighting to get on this committee and ultimately on the subcommittee when he said, when I asked, uh, as, as maybe some of you did, what the jurisdiction was of this uh, committee, and he point to, pointed to a globe <laughs> and said it's the, it's the entire world. And, uh, and Debbie uh, and I served together uh, well and uh, respect that, and so I, I appreciate your, your opening comments about uh, supporting giving prayers to John and Debbie at this time. Also, congratulations to you as chairman of this subcommittee and uh, also to my good friend and the border, border protector uh, leader, uh, Republican Leader Latta. Uh, I'm happy uh, to serve on this, uh, this subcommittee, uh, finally, uh, in, in Congress. And in that spirit of bipartisanship, uh, I hope today's hearing provides a good foundation for finding a bipartisan consensus on net neutrality legislation. Uh, that at the very least ratchets down, and Mr. Fresnel, I, I identify with you a bit, um, uh, having had a, uh, a firebombing threat, uh, uh, and I take that personally, and the FBI thankfully did as well, um, and took action relative to that. And my position, which at this time I didn't serve on this subcommittee, um, uh, and it wasn't involved in that debate, um, it's an emotional issue, and I hope we all can ratchet it down. I stand ready and willing to find a compromise that protects consumers from anti-competitive harms while not sacrificing long-standing bipartisan policies that uh, should uh, and could promote broadband expansion in the rural parts of my district in southern Michigan, something that remains a challenge today and which I hope we address in this Congress. So, Mr. Fresnel, when it comes down to your business decision, <coughs> uh, which probably mirror a lot of what goes on in my district as well, like investing in expanded broadband access and upgrading networks to 1G and soon 10G speeds, uh, does the content preference of a handful of people drive those investment decisions? Oh. So it's broader than that. It is broader than that. And if I may, I, I don't want to lose, I, please don't lose sight of the fact that there are still large swaths of the United States that are underserved or unserved. And so any legislation or regulation that we put in place to, together, we have to keep in mind the fact that whatever we do should <coughs> not impede our ability to expand into those areas and take care of those folks. And if I could give one quick. So is there any reason for you to block throttle or? No, heavens no. No. Uh, again, I'm, every dollar I make, I spend on infrastructure. We responded to an RFP to provide broadband to every address in Wheeler County, Oregon. Wheeler County is uh, 1,750 square miles. The state of Rhode Island is 1,214. So it's larger by a chunk than the state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island has over a million people. The Wheeler County has about 1,400. And so, but those folks still live, work, contribute, uh, and, and trying to access them and provide broadband to them is only possible if I don't have barriers that are unnecessary, hurdles that I have to jump over, and we can provide broadband to them. We responded to the RFP, we're hopeful. So there is hope for that, but. Okay, I, hope well, I appreciate that, and that's yes. based upon what the customer wants, what they yes. need, and what you're able to, to give. Absolutely. And based upon I have, I have no incentive here. to throttle block or that's not the business we're in. Thank you. Mr. Powell, um, when you talk about upgrading your networks, uh, the networks to 1G speeds and the consumer demand for faster I internet, uh, that's mostly driven by evolving mo more data demanding applications, services, websites, uh, like video applications, correct? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, 
and as the Internet matures, um, is it fair to say that your member companies are going to need to continue innovating and finding ways to manage their networks in order to ensure consumers get the lawful content uh, that they want and that they can access uh, that content without a noticeable delay? Yes, and your, your first question, just by way of a data point, according to Cisco, by 2021, 82 percent of all, vi all Internet traffic will be video. That's a massive bandwidth intensive <coughs> set of applications, and we have to dramatically increase network capacity. And that involves a lot of flexibility too, doesn't it? Absolutely. Um, can you reasonably manage your network if broadband is codified as an information service under Title I? of the Communications Act, and is there adequate enforcement to make sure you're not gaming this exception? We believe so. Um, so what you're essentially telling me today is the FCC can protect consumers from blocking, throttling, and paid prioritization, and both ISPs and edge providers will still be able to manage their networks, innovate, and make updates to keep up with consumers if the FCC is given Title I authority with robust enforcement? Yes, and I would add the fact that under Title I, you also have the additional enforcement capabilities of the Federal Trade Commission, which remain viable under that regime but would not be viable under Title II. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. <coughs> Chair now recognizes uh, my friend and colleague from California, Ms. Eshu, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is an important hearing, and uh, I want to thank each one of the witnesses. Uh, Ms. Dixon, I'm so proud to uh, um, represent uh, Brasilia. They're headquartered in, in my congressional district, and you gave excellent testimony, especially about one of the most important things that happens in Silicon Valley, and that is new ideas being born every single day. And uh, if they don't have the tools to do that, uh, we represent the innovation capital of our country. So your testimony is very powerful. Uh, to, um, uh, to Ms. Um, Olivier, you just killed it. <laughs> you really did. I'll tell you, you are, uh, your writing is powerful. Your artistry is powerful. Your voice is powerful, and um, amen. Thank uh, you. I, I don't know how you do all the things that you're doing. An actress, a writer, a UCLA doctoral student. My goodness. Um, uh, Jessica, thank you. You're always outstanding, and you represent a great organization. Uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Fresnel, you're a good man, and uh, you're in the struggle of doing something that really needs to be done, and that is when we have one third of the American people who either do are either underserved or not served at all. Uh, you're a hero in my book. You have a great. Uh, he's not here, so he's not going to hear me. Uh, your congressman is a terrific uh, representative. Uh, to Michael Powell, I haven't seen you in a long time. It's great to see you. I wish we agreed with each other. We don't. <laughs> But our friendship is going to survive uh, net neutrality and to uh, uh, um, and, and both of the former chairmen. You're, you're both really distinguished uh, people who have done um, uh, extraordinary work in the public sector that isn't always appreciated. Um, I haven't changed my mind. And uh, this is not a bragging point, but I'm proud of where I am and it's an important debate. Everyone says that they love the internet, how important it is. Where were so many people when two years ago, this uh, last month, when privacy, ripping, off priva ripping privacy off of the internet went through here like a bolt of lightning? Who came in? Were you here, Michael? You weren't here. Were any of the people that you represent here? No. You know, it, it, this Title II has just been beaten to a pulp. I want to read out what applies. You decide in the audience, and maybe the American people that are listening in, how really um, menacing these provisions are. 
It prohibits unjust and unreasonable discrimination in charges, practices, and services. So are we for discrimination? You know, a lot of references have been made to old laws. You know what the oldest one is? The Constitution. Maybe, maybe, you know, that's got so much dust on it, maybe we should throw that one out too. Common carriers that violate provisions of Title II are liable for full damages and attorney's fees. FCC can recover or order on their behalf. Carriers are liable for actions of agents when acting within the scope of their employment. What's so horrible about that? Provides process for FCC to receive consumer complaints and assist consumers in working out the issue with the carrier. Oh my God, God help us if we help people with their consumer complaints. Protect privacy of consumer information and data. Boy, that is really darkly menacing, isn't it? It's just, I'm telling you, the sky's caving in. Ensures fair access to polls and conduits. That's, that's a showstopper, isn't it? Is your heart stopping? Ensures access to telecommunication services for people with disabilities. You know, well, we can't have that. I mean, that is, that's just off the charts. Uh, apply certain universal service principles, but does not require universal service fund contributions. You know where the whole thing rests? It rests around just and reasonable charges and practices. It's money. It's money. That's where the whole debate rests. Because on the rest of it, no one can hold their head up, just as Mr. Fresnel said, absolutely not. I don't block and uh, prioritization and all of that. And, you know, the industry has uh, really behaved themselves for a while until the court decides what it's going to do. Uh, but you know what? The worst example is public safety. You know, I mean, it just like ripped the veil off of this whole thing. Firefighters and someone at the other end saying, you know what, if you want more service, we'll charge you more and you can get it. And people's lives are at stake. I mean, come on. So, you know, to say that uh, uh, these provisions, these are the provisions, what I just read are what apply. There are the majority of Title II, uh, there is forbearance. So, you the don't believe- The gentlelady's time you know, has expired. You, know, you don't believe in what's forborn, and you don't accept this. I don't think these are menacing things, and I think that they are worth fighting for. I really do. And- uh, how this is going to be settled, I don't know. Uh, but um, the internet is uh, an open, free, accessible internet, I think is consistent <laughs> with our Constitution and the values of the American people. And uh, I thank the chairman for his forbearance. <laughs> <laughs> the gentlelady's time has long expired. Uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman, uh, Mr. Gianforti, you're recognized for five minutes. From Montana. From Montana. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the panel for being here today. I appreciate this discussion. Uh, the Internet as we know it came to be around 1995, and for 20 years it was open and free. It ushered in innovation, transformed our economy, leading to a new high-tech sector and good-paying jobs. That open and free Internet gave us Amazon, Facebook, Google, and the company my wife and I started in our home in Bozeman, Montana. Um, we had an idea that the internet might actually make it possible for folks to work anywhere. That the internet might actually remove geography as a constraint. Our company grew from that one little room to one of Montana's largest employers. We had 1,100 employees uh, with an average Montana wage of almost $90,000 a year. Our business is just one example of how a free and open internet uh, created more high-paying American jobs and increased opportunity and greater prosperity. In 2015, however, the Obama administration throttled the free and open internet and with unnecessary and unilateral regulations. The red tape was a solution looking for a problem. The internet is a lifeline for our rural communities. It 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 contributes to our rural economies, it 
ties together high tech and agriculture, education and health care. Uh, one in three Montanans lacks access to broadband. Unfortunately, these heavy-handed regulatory approach uh, has been a challenge for small telecommunications providers in our, in my district. Um, even the smallest federal mandate could impact our rural providers and their ability to extend their service to new communities, further exacerbating the digital divide that we experience in this country. As I look around this committee today and all of the testimony, I think we have a lot of agreement. I don't see anyone who opposes opening the doors of opportunity to Americans in rural communities, and I don't know anyone who wants to discourage the expansion of broadband into more communities. And I don't know of anyone here who wants providers to block or throttle consumers. I think we all agree on these issues. But the internet of 2019 is not the rotary phone of 1934. And it shouldn't be treated as such with outdated, heavy-handed regulations. I came to Washington to solve problems, and that's what Montanans expect. The committee should work on a permanent legislative fix to promote a free and open internet with a light touch regulatory framework. Ultimately, Congress can't and shouldn't turn over authority to unelected bureaucrats <coughs> who, can man who can change how they treat the internet from administration to administration. The internet has changed our economy in this country. It's created jobs, provided better quality of life for many Americans. Uh, we must be cautious about how we approach this. And I look forward to working with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to find a solution that works for both sides. So in the little bit of time I have left, Mr. Fennell, I'd like to direct a couple of questions to you. You testified earlier that these Obama-era regulations cut off access to capital for your business. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I'd like to have you just highlight for us, if you would, when a business like yours that's providing broadband to rural communities does not have access to capital, what's the impact? Well, for instance, now that capital is freed up, and I'll answer it because now we have capital, uh, there are three rural communities totaling about eight or 900 homes uh, to our east, and they're ro remote. Uh, they currently are all, by any definition, underserved. Our plans now, and we have the capital to do it, are to build fiber to the home in those three communities with no government subsidies. So that will transform those communities in really dramatic ways. I mentioned the Wheeler County RFP that we responded to. With capital, we have a plan to provide robust, at least 25-3, but in many cases, 100 meg service to every address in Wheeler County. And by any definition, that's a frontier county, one of the most difficult to get to. So without that capital, I can't do that. All I can do is maintain. In what these I've got. communities, are you providing broadband to schools? We'll provide broadband to, you know, it's not just residential. We do anchor institutions, residential, and commercial. And do you provide broadband to critical access hospitals in these we communities? We do, yeah. yes. And <coughs> without capital, you're unable to do that? That's correct. Okay. Uh, I thank you for your testimony, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes a gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the witnesses. I'm told that the hour is late, and we're going to be have, having to rush to the floor in just a few minutes, and so I'm going to try to get through this as, as quickly as I can. And I'm surprised to know that so many of my colleagues also represent rural communities, and, and that's good to know because I, too, represent a rural community in, in eastern North Carolina. But the word last mile has not been expressly uh, mentioned here in, in this hearing. And so I want to, to put it in on the table and make sure that we are, are very clear. Uh, we've got to continue to work on the last mile. We've got to encourage investment. Uh, I certainly agree with that. And, and Internet access in rural communities is of paramount importance. Uh, too many citizens are without, and they are being disadvantaged. So let me move to, uh, to Chairman Powell. Chair Chairman, uh, you offer clear support uh, for net neutrality rules, including no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. Uh, we certainly thank you for that. And this tells me that providers are taking the net neutrality protection very seriously. But as you know, net neutrality rules, the 2015 rules, are being challenged in the courts, and they're working their way through uh, through the courts. And so my, uh, we, we will have a decision, I suppose, uh, very soon. Uh, wh why are you uh, calling on Congress to step in, uh, considering that, that uh, these 2015 rules are being litigated? Why, why should Congress step in at this point? 
Well, thank you for the question. I think, I think that's a good explanation of why, because the, the this is the fourth time these rules have gone to court. Each court cycle is three years in length. Whatever happens. I'm a recovering judge now. Uh, <laughs> it was good to you. Um, Go you know, even if we yeah. get a decision this summer, there's going to be appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court, potentially, no matter how the result comes out. That's a whole nother year or so uh, before you reach a decision. If the court reaches a mixed decision and part of it's upheld and part of it's remanded, there's a whole nother FCC regulatory process that could take another year before we even get a final compilation of those rules. There comes a point uh, at which it's obvious that the problem the Commission struggles with is the absence of clear direction from the people's representatives, and that would bring finality and moot uh, the court jurisdictional fight, and that's why we call on you. What regulatory framework will best assist in expanding broadband access in rural communities like I represent? One that's very, very favorable to incentivizing the investment of private capital because the fundamental problem of a rural community is it's inherently uneconomic to serve. That is, there is either not enough revenue to cover the cost of deployment or the cost of deployment is too high based on the amount of revenue available. Anything that might raise those costs significantly only further impedes uh, the ability to meet those remote areas. Now, you mentioned the need for stronger protections for consumers and providers. Do you support Congress creating these new protections, and what types of proposals would you consider to be strong? Uh, I do wholeheartedly. Um, in many ways, it's, it's odd for me to hear people criticizing the Bright Line rules. I've watched this issue for 14 years. Uh, the movement to Bright Line rules was, was proposed by the most virulent advocates of net neutrality uh, in order to bring certainty and clarity to what's covered. Um, we have evolved with the debate, uh, and we fully endorse uh, those rules that the Commission adopted in 2015, the ones that were adopted in 2010, uh, and we're perfectly willing to work with you on uh, any new set of rules you might consider. Thank you. Finally, Ms. Gonzalez, thank you for highlighting the disparities that exist in traditional media for minority communities. I, I share those concerns. Can you tell me the effect that net neutrality violations like blocking and throttling might have on minority communities? And you have a minute to do that. Uh, yes, Congressman, thank you for the question. You know, I think uh, traditionally we have not had a voice in the media in the same way that white folks have. Uh, the open internet has democratized uh, not only our access to find an audience to uh, uh, to create small businesses, to make sure that we are able to tell our own stories in our own words. And so if there is blocking or throttling, uh, that would uh, lessen our access to uh, having our stories told in the American fabric that has all otherwise been defined by mainstream media gatekeepers. So you're saying that it would disproportionately affect minority communities or? I would say yes, yeah. yeah, because we've had less access to mainstream media and um, the access to the internet to tell our stories has been critically important to change the narrative and invite people to understand who we are. Yeah. Thank you for your passion. I support you completely. Thank, Thank you, you Chairman, I yield back. Three Thank seconds. You. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Flores for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this hearing. I appreciate the witnesses for joining us today. Uh, I think uh, I'm picking up a consensus that Congress needs to act, that it needs to develop a new section to prohibit it, uh, throttling, blocking, and discrimination on the Internet. And I think that we can find a way to do that and do it in a way that does keeps the FCC out of the, the uh, uh, litigation box, if you will. Um, that said, my concern about the way Title X has been, has been attempted to be used in the past is that it doesn't have anything to do with net neutrality, and so it's, it's, it's not an effective tool for that purpose. That's the reason Congress needs to act. Uh, so let's ask some questions about Title II just so we can get an idea of what could go wrong if you had another FCC that wanted to try to go further than, than even the 2015 FCC. So Chairman Powell, uh, could you confirm whether Title II could lead to the following, the government setting prices? Yes, that's possible. The government determining what services ISPs can offer consumers and whether and how they are bundled? That is also possible. That the government uh, could be directing where ISPs put their investments and how much they should earn? Yes. Okay. That the government can dictate how parts of the Internet should be interconnected and on what terms? Most definitely. Okay. And then uh, the government requiring ISPs to share their networks that they built with private capital? 
Yes. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, this is a little bit of a wild card. Could it be used? We're all excited about the potential of 5G, and I know we're talking wireless versus wired, but is there any way that Title II could be used to inhibit the, ro the effective and efficient rollout of 5G? Well, as we said, if 5G is a telecommunication service, not only the voice component of it, but the data component of it, uh, then it would uh, it would suffer from the same restrictions that we've talked about all afternoon. I, I look at 5G as a dynamic information service, and it, communications just happens to ride on a, a small part of it. Um, Mr. Fennell, like you, I, I represent several rural counties in Texas, and I'm very concerned about uh, trying to make sure that those rural counties have the opportunity to move to the dynamic side of the digital divide. And you discuss in your testimony how every dollar that goes to regulation is a dollar that doesn't go into new broadband infrastructure. Uh, don't these kinds of owners regulations in Title II crowd out competition and force smaller operators out of business? Uh, I, yes, I think. And so I have, I have specific concerns about Title II, and if you'll bear with me, let me list them real be, quick. Be brief. Real quick. <laughs> okay. First one is the determining price. And it, the... The cost to build infrastructure and deliver broadband varies wildly based on location. Correct. And so price make, determining price can be catastrophic for rural broadband. Uh, the, the second thing is taxation and fees on broadband. And uh, if you were to apply State Universal Service Fund of Oregon, Federal Universal Service Fund, and, and then franchise fees to broadband, because <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, applying Title II mm -hmm. and removing That's that right. exemption, you could end up with a 20 to 30 percent increase in end-user broadband costs okay. with no productive outcome. That's so another. Th those are the things that concern me about okay. Title II. Okay. That's the reason t uh, Congress needs to come up with a new yes. title to deal with a, uh, a new, new uh, area of technology. Um, my friend Mr. Shimkus ran out of time, and I heard uh, Chairman Wheeler and, and uh, Chairman Powell answer this question that he had about prioritizing Internet traffic to protect our borders. I just wanted to see if the rest of the panel agreed. Uh, should uh, Ms. Dixon, should Internet traffic be prioritized to protect our border? We already have an exception in the 2015 order with respect to public safety. So that would be a yes. Okay. Ms. Livier? I echo her Okay. Response. Uh, Mr. Fresnel? Yes. Okay. Ms. Gonzalez? No. Okay. Uh, if not, why? Quickly. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to construct any more uh, walls on our border. Okay. I just am morally opposed to that. Gotcha. Okay. And lastly, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, there was a comment made in, in the testimony, both uh, verbal and written, that says that um, it says to the extent that Mozilla would not exist today without net neutrality. I want to give you some dates for the record. Uh, the first version of, of uh, Phoenix, which ultimately became Firefox, rolled out in 2002. Uh, Firefox 1.0 rolled out in 2004. The FCC Open Internet rule was in effect, was rolled out in February of 2015. It became effective in June of 2015, so Mozilla <laughs> prospered. Uh, before uh, net neutrality was in place. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Chair now rep recognizes the vice chair of our subcommittee, uh, Ms. Matsui. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to all the witnesses. I know it's been a long time sitting there. Um, I know many issues have been covered today, and I, one of the issues that I want to um, concern our ourselves with is we continue to grapple with uh, network security in the current next generation networks. And the issue has even gained uh, more um, notoriety because of the potential intelligence threats posed by Huawei and ZTE. Now, these companies have provided access to inexpensive and readily available networking equipment to carriers in the U.S. and around the world. And as many of you know, the FCC is currently considering how to balance its universal service mandate with the need to ensure our communication networks are secure from the threat of foreign actors. Now, in the larger conversation surrounding net neutrality, broadband expansion, and next generation networks, how should we balance these security concerns? Now, I, ex I expect the chairman would have some things to say about it, but I was wondering if anyone else on the panel wanted to start. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman Powell, would you like to say something? Uh, 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 yes, Congressman, thank you. Um, we, we have to put front and center concerns, increasing concerns about 
supply chain security, and it needs to be designed from the beginning up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Congress has addressed supply chain issues recently in the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, which we support, and DHS recently launched a supply chain risk management uh, effort, which NCTA, NCTA members uh, actively participate in. So we think this is an extraordinarily important activity, uh, and we remain committed and highly focused on these issues. Okay. Chairman Wheeler? History is clear that networks are attack vectors, and we should expect that the network of the 21st century is an attack vector for cyber attacks. The question is whether we are going to sit back and play whack-a-mole in response to those attacks or whether we're going to get in front of them. Right. The, Mike just talked about the uh, supply chain. Um, as we left the commission, we put out a report on the importance of supply chain cyber management to networks that the Trump FCC then pulled. The Trump FCC has repeatedly said they don't think they have any jurisdiction over the security of the network they have been entrusted to oversee. Um, they pulled the requirements that we put in place for 5G cyber security. And, um, and what we're in the process of blowing is the opportunity to deal with cyber as a forethought rather than as an afterthought. Okay. Um, you know, I mentioned here as part of this the universal service <coughs> mandate, and I know a lot of people probably think this is boring, but it really isn't. Uh, contribution reform regarding the universal service fund, I think in 2006 this committee considered an effort aimed to ensure a stable contribution base for universal service. Um, the Universal Service Fund codified the belief that all Americans should have access to advanced communication services and rural customers should have access to reasonably com comparable services at reasonably comparable rates. Now, contributions to the federal and universal service support mechanisms are currently based on a percentage of carriers' interstate and international end-user telecommunications revenues. A necessary part of this discussion surrounding broadband classification is the issue of contribution reform. In the first quarter of 2019, the contribution factor is 20%, and that number may well continue to climb. Thirteen years ago, the committee considered several different methodologies for the FCC to use when assessing universal service contributions. Mindful, we should not make any broadband access less affordable, but do you have any suggestions on how to ensure the long term stability of the Universal Service Fund. And uh, we don't have much time, but you might comment on it. Yes, you need to expand the base. You cannot rely on a shrinking ice cube. Absolutely, but we seem to kick, kick the but every ice time, cube down But every the road. time you want to talk about expanding the base, you hear what we hear today. Oh, that's going to increase costs for this broadband service or that. We have a, we have, we've heard today the importance of delivering to Wheeler County. Boy, I like that. Um, and, um, and to rural America. Um, and we have also heard, but let's don't raise the money to support that. Right. Okay. That's the conflict, and again, it falls. Well, this is a central conflict. General Lady's time has expired. We're going to try to get this in before votes, and we still have four more witnesses. So I thank the General Lady for her patience. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the panel. Uh, a big concern I have, no matter what we do, is to get uh, broadband built out in rural areas. You just mentioned that, Mr. Wheeler. Um, and Mr. Fresnel, I congratulate you. Uh, I live in a rural part of Vermont, eight-mile dirt road, and we have high-speed internet. And uh, it's a local small company, uh, nonprofit, that somehow figured out to do what the big telecoms haven't done. And listening to you, it sounds like you've done that as well. So my hat is off to you. But on this question of repealing the net neutrality rules that were uh, part of the uh, Wheeler uh, FCC, one of the arguments that was made is that if we got rid of uh, the heavy hand of regulation, that it would result in an expansive um, uh, capital-intensive uh, commitment by our major telecom carriers uh, that would build out uh, into rural America. 
And it turns out uh, that's a fairy tale. Uh, I mean, Chairman Pai, because this was a question I think I asked him, he said, without the overhang of heavy-handed regulation, and, and I don't know where this heavy-handed deal is coming from, because everyone who's complaining about the heavy hand says they're for what the light hand accomplished. So there's a lot of rhetoric here. But what Chairman Pai said quite specifically was, without the overhang of heavy-handed regulations, companies will spend more building the next generation networks. As those networks expand, many more Americans, especially, especially low-income rural and urban Americans, will get high-speed internet access for the first time. And it turns out my skepticism of that assertion uh, has been proven right. Today, the Financial Times reported uh, that the big four U.S. broadband companies invested less in capital projects last year than they did in 2017, which is when the, uh, the Wheeler net neutrality rules were still in place, which totally undermines one of the rationales for repealing the net neutrality rules. And it also showed that article, that the four companies under, uh, collectively undertook less capital spending in 2018. And that's the first time there's been a drop in three years when the net neutrality uh, rules were first put in place. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, put the Financial Times article published today in the record, if I may. Without objection, so moved. All right. So in, we all know about the inadequacy in rural America. 24 million Americans lack access to fixed broadband uh, at high-speed internet speeds. 31 percent of Americans in rural areas lack access to broadband. 44 million Americans lack access to both fixed broadband at 25.3 speeds uh, and mobile LTE broadband at 10.3 speeds. Uh, I mean, it, we have, uh, we're on the verge of abandoning rural America. And that's got to change. And it's not just regulations. This is about investment. Somehow you figured out how to do it. EC Fibers figured out to do it. Uh, my view, the big four don't particularly care to do it. There's not a lot of money to be made for them. So now we have a situation where we don't have the protection of the net neutrality rules in the Wheeler administration in rural America, and we're not getting a build out. And I'll just ask you, Mr. Wheeler, are you surprised by the earnings report that indicate no increase in capital expenditures uh, since the net neutrality rules came off the books? No, sir. Mr. Powell, uh, can you explain the decrease in capital expenditures last year compared to the previous three years? I can. The, he the headline numbers in those reports are wrong because capital expenditure in net involves more than investments just in networks. If you look carefully at the earnings reports, an enormous amount of that capital reduction was due to the video business and the CPE business, not the network connectivity business. If you sorted out those decreases for loss of video investment because of competition, you'd find that the increase, there has been an increase in investment in networks. Okay, I don't want to dwell on this, but I don't understand the word you just said. Uh, and no, and it's not, I don't mean that. Uh, I really don't understand it. Maybe I have to be an accountant. But bottom line, these are year-over-year -year numbers. And what I'm seeing is that whatever that explanation is, there's not more Internet access in rural America. I mean, we need more people like your company. Mr. Gonzalez, would antitrust law prevent an ISP from blocking access to lawful website that presents an opinion the ISP does not want? No. Uh, would antitrust law address uh, would antitrust law address the situation, uh, uh, Ms. Gonzalez, where an ISP slowed down lawful internet traffic after it was pressured to do so by a political figure? No. Gentleman's time has expired. Yeah, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Luhan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, we we know that this definitely matters. Um, otherwise, there wouldn't be so much interest, uh, not just here in this committee room, but with the millions of people across America who responded to this order. Um, I know that we're still trying to make sense of the number of bots and trolls that are part of that filing, but nonetheless, uh, I hope that Chairman Pai um, allows us to make sense of who is a real person and which part of those filings should be taken out. I hope that we'd all agree 
with that. The foundation of a record in order to make a decision is only as solid as the quality of the information that's been collected. I, I think that as chairman, I would hope uh, Chairman Powell and Chairman Wheeler, you'd both agree with that, um, with the importance of what happens at the commission. Um, now, when Chairman Pai announced that he was repealing the 2015 open internet order, he said, and I quote, many more Americans, especially low income rural and urban Americans, will get high speed internet access for the first time. And more Americans generally will benefit from faster and better broadband. So, Mr. Wheeler, uh, the question that I have there is, is this true? Does the repeal of the 2015 open internet order mean that more New Mexicans will have access to high speed broadband? And how does the repeal of that order meaningful ch meaningfully change the economics of building out in rural and tribal communities? Mr. Lujan, um, this self-serving economics manipulation has been used by the Trump FCC like a drunk uses a lamppost to lean against to support the unsupportable. We have heard comments about what investment was before and what investment was afterwards. Um, there is only one reason to invest and that is to get a return. You don't say I'm not going to invest because of regulation. You say I'm going to invest because I'm going to get a return. And one of the things we have to do, especially in New Mexico and other rural states, is to make sure that we have programs in place that help get that return, a universal service uh, support program, which itself needs to be directed towards building towards capital expenditures rather than operating expenditures. And Mr. Powell, in your response to Mr. Welch, I think you touched on this. Do you have the same viewpoint of Mr. Wheeler, or would you agree with the, the sentiment of my question? I, I would say since 2016, at least in the cable industry, we have had a very significant increase in our network investment. Two years ago, 4% of Americans had one gigabit speeds. Uh, as of the end of 2018 in our industry, 80% of American households had gigabit speeds. And That's a pretty Mr. Powell, my question is specific to tribal communities in rural America in places like where I live. Does the same hold true in states like mine with the statistics you just laid out? So if I went back and I evaluated your response, would, would I see a correlation in New Mexico? You, well, you, look, the, the low income, hard to serve areas are a problem we all agree with serving. Um, I'm not so sure whether any of these orders fundamentally change that challenge. But yes, I believe some of this advancement for the citizens of New Mexico uh, is just as viable as it is in other states. Well, I, I appreciate your response because we agree with these challenges. Chairman Pai said that this was going to revolutionize access in rural America and to tribal communities and places like where I live. Well, and he's the not, other brown guy. Well, I'm not the no, one. No, but my point is it's not true. <clears throat> It, it's, it's not true. And that's the concern of the, that I have for the constituents that I represent. Um, I'll park that aside. Um, there are a few things, Mr. Chairman, that I want to get into the record, and I have one question for Ms. Gonzalez I want to get in. There's an article that I want to submit into the record. Um, it's now clear none of the supposed benefits of killing net neutrality are real. This points to the question I just asked. It's an article by Carl Bode with Motherboard, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. A letter from the internet service providers to Chairman Pai uh, with concerns associated with the order um, as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, dated June 27, 2017. Without objection. Um, an article filtering out the bots, what Americans actually have told the FCC about net neutrality repeal. This goes to the essence of my opening statement as well, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Um, and statements from my district as well. Um, associated with net neutrality that I would like submitted into the record. And Ms. Gonzalez, I apologize, my time Without objection. expired. I will submit this um, to you um, uh, for the record. And I have a few other questions that I'll submit to the remaining panelists. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time's expired. The chair recognizes Mr. Schrader for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses for coming here. An excellent testimony. Uh, I have to admit I came to this hearing with some degree of trepidation about how it might be conducted and uh, I'd like to think uh, we demonstrated a good civil discourse on a very contentious issue that 
from my standpoint, everyone seemed to be in agreement we should fix. Uh, devil's in the details, how to go about that, of course. Uh, but everyone came out in favor of the key elements of net neutrality that at least spoke, which was encouraging from my standpoint. Uh, and folks seem to be interested <coughs> in actually solving the problem, be close on solving uh, the problem going forward. Uh, this thing's been floating around since the Bush administration. Uh, 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 rules of the road seem to be depending on which party occupies the, the central office, the presidency. Uh, I think Chairman Powell, you mentioned your testimony over the last 15 years, six different FCC chairmen from both political parties have wrestled with this issue. Net neutrality has been in the courts four different times, more coming up from what you were saying. Uh, I, you know, I have to believe this leaves consumers you know, virtually unprotected and businesses completely in the dark about what the rules of the road are. And that's not good for anybody or everybody uh, at the end of the day. Uh, consumers uh, and uh, folks in the industry, I think, uh, all agree we need the transparency, no blocking, no throttling, no pay prioritization except for health and public safety. That came out here today. Uh, and no discrimination. Thank you very much for the testimony that uh, uh, Ms. Gonzalez and Ms. Olivier gave. I think that's very important. I'm an Article I of the Constitution person at heart. Uh, my job is to legislate. Congress is supposed to be the legislative body. We've uh, uh, far too long abdicated, I think, our responsibilities to the executive branch, and we end up putting Mr. Wheeler and Mr. Powell in tough situations, doing the best they can. They've done <coughs> yeoman's work. I appreciate the work both of you uh, uh, have done. Uh, so I think what we've heard so far today is that Congress has failed, you know, to provide the FCC with clear legislative uh, and congressional direction. And I, for one, like several others here, have also said today, favor that we, we go down that route. Uh, last Congress, I supported Congress, or excuse me, Chairman Doyle's resolution of disapproval of Chairman Pai's rule, uh, because it's pretty irresponsible for Chairman Pai to roll back uh, the wheel order without pu putting in any other or, you know, enforceable protections for consumers. I'd love to see our subcommittee work in a bipartisan manner, uh, finally codify some rules with all your help and people out there back in my home district uh, to protect consumers and provide those clear rules of the road. I, th I think there's an opportunity. And for my colleagues who are truly concerned following Chairman Pai's action about uh, consumers not being protected right now, if we choose not to solve this problem in this Congress, then those consumers will continue to be at risk at least over the next two years and quite possibly into the distant future. So I think it's time to end the uh, uncertainty for consumers and businesses. Do our job, legislate net neutrality. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Uh, recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Cardenas, five minutes. <coughs> thank, you very, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you so much for having this hearing. Um, I take it that everybody at this panel is, is for open and free uh, internet. Is that true? Mr. I Chairman? am. Yes. 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 Drew? You bet. Mr. Chairman, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> problem solved. It's, it's not an issue. Um, some people would have uh, believed that just allowing things to be the way they are is solving a problem. But I believe that doing nothing in today's space and watching the courts decide the fate of consumers, of smaller businesses, good actors like yourself, Mr. Frenel, I'm, I'm very impressed with, with your <coughs> intent and your actions. Thank you so much. But not every actor on the playing field that we're talking about today has that kind of will and commitment to not do things differently if, in fact, the lanes are not defined. And that's the biggest problem that we have here. I think we have two former incredible chairmen here. I have so much respect for both of you, uh, former Chairman Powell and former Chairman Wheeler. Every time I talk with you, I feel enlightened. And I'm not joking. I really, really do. The ability for you to, to articulate the decades of knowledge that you have on something that even one of my colleagues actually said, I don't even understand what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is amazing. And thank you for your service. Thank you for your service when you were in the public sector as chairman of the commission, and thank you for your service in the private sector continuing to try to wrap your head around how do we make a better world for everybody. So thank you so much. 
And to all of you, uh, Ms. Gonzalez, for what you do, and, and I believe that you're in, in, the, in the public sector in the sense that you work for a not-for-profit and you're just trying to make things better. For the least among us, and I don't mean it in a derogatory way, I'm talking about the smallest of the smallest businesses, the, the mothers and fathers who they just want to make a life for their family better, and this happens to be the space that they're doing it in. And for those of you who are in the smaller space uh, on the playing field, God bless you because you can get squashed like a bug or run over in a moment's notice, and most people wouldn't even know you're gone. So thank you for all that you do. But Ms. Dixon, uh, if you uh, want to take the opportunity, I think that there was a question that uh, my esteemed colleague from Texas, Mr. Flores, mentioned Firefox, and I think that you may have wanted to comment, uh, but ran out of time. I did. I think that the, the the notion that Firefox and that Mozilla was created at a time when net neutrality rules weren't in play is just silly. We are starting back from the status quo. I, as much as I um, have a ton of respect for, for Chairman Wheeler, he didn't actually create net neutrality. <laughs> net neutrality existed on the internet for years and years and years. Uh, what we had, we had principles under uh, Chairman Powell's uh, regime for, uh, in, in the FCC. We also had merger agreements that had restrictions with respect to net neutrality. We had lots of protections in play, and that is what the web was founded on. So we were founded, Mozilla and Firefox, during an era when net neutrality was strong. It is now, today, for the first time, that we actually don't have net neutrality rules that protect consumers. Thank you. Okay. Um, and, and the thing is, when, when you talk about protections, I call them lanes. Uh, I happen to have been a small business owner at one time in a regulated industry, and some of my colleagues would get upset when more regulations would come along. And I would look at those regulations and read them, and then I would realize that many of them actually helped us stay within our lane and actually helped us make sure that we stayed out of the legal system because we had lanes that we could follow, and when we followed them, we could defend ourselves and say we did proper practice when somebody was trying to sue us or what have you and things of that nature. So lanes, to me, are very important, and this is an, an arena where uh, the lanes are, are basically uh, muddled, and right now the courts just might even make it even worse as far as less lanes for us to, for everyone to follow by. Um, and, but also, Mr. Frenel, I, again, my compliments to you. Uh, but at the same time, you, you ma mentioned something in your opening statement about the bad actors and, and kind of like, you know what, the bad act actors, they'll get weeded out because they'll lose business. But with all due respect, the, s the smallest business is in this space can disappear almost overnight because of a bad actor that they had, you know, you know run, in, uh, run into like a Mack truck. That is, that is my concern, that when we have lanes, less of that the smallest players on the field disappear. And I just want to thank uh, Vanessa, if you don't mind, I, I met your daughter, if you don't mind me mentioning her name. Uh, people like Vanessa, this is the means of which she feeds her daughter, Alina. And I just got to tell you, um, we have to make sure that what we do, Mr. Chairman, and I'll yield back in just a, two seconds, we have to think about everybody, not just the largest players on the playing field. Thank you. And Gentleman yields back. Uh, committee would like to welcome Ms. Ms. War Ms. McMorris Rogers, who waved on today, and uh, you're welcome to speak for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the chance to join you all today on an issue that I believe should have been resolved probably many years ago in a bipartisan fashion. Up until really 2015, there had been decades of bipartisan consensus on, a, on the principles of an open, free Internet principles that would ensure consumer protections without disrupting the free flow of information and innovation that has made it the cornerstone of our 21st century economy. This debate isn't about the merits of an open free internet. I support an open free internet. We think we have a large agreement on supporting an, an open free internet. Colleagues on both sides of the, of the aisle have mentioned that. This is really about how we as Americans want to shape the future of our economy. Do we want to regulate the Internet as a 1930s-style utility where we have more burdensome regulation and <coughs> price controls that I fear will stifle innovation, an inter Internet that will leave many rural and, p and underserved communities behind, like in my district? Or do we want a 21st century Internet that will juice our economy, create jobs, and allow us to be a leader in new cutting-edge technologies like AI or IoT, autonomous vehicles? 
an economy that utilizes advances in technology to lift people out of poverty and provide them with more economic opportunities. I think we all agree that we want the later. That's why I'm introducing the Promoting Free uh, Internet Freedom and Innovation Act. And this bill is based upon Washington state law. and would codify the bright line rules of net neutrality, specifically no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. This is a solution that passed in my home state on a widely bipartisan basis, a bill that was signed by my Democratic governor, supported by Democrats in the congressional delegation, and was praised by former FCC Commissioner Clyburn. But most importantly, it's a solution that does not institute changes to the internet that would stop innovation, stifle broadband deployment, and leave millions of Americans behind. A solution that codifies the, the key principles on which both parties agree and have agreed for many years the internet has revolutionized every single aspect of our lives. It's changed how we communicate. It's changed uh, how we approach our own personal health or travel across town. It's improved the quality of life for millions of Americans. We all agree it's vital to our future and the opportunity that it provides for our economy and hard working men and women in our 21st century is really endless. I want to once and, and for all resolve what I believe is a manufactured political debate and provide certainty to the internet ecosystem so that we can make that opportunity a reality for every single American. So I would like to focus my questioning on the federal versus state debate. While I believe that the provisions of the Washington, Washington state law are reasonable and consistent with the principles both parties have been discussing at the federal level for years now, I do not believe that it is wise to regulate by a state-by-state state approach. The internet is the key to interstate commerce. It does not end at our borders, and a federal solution is the only way forward. Chairman Powell, can you briefly discuss why pursuing an open internet regulation at the state level can be harmful to innovation and consumers, and why do we need the, the federal solution? I remember when the internet really rose, there was a economist author named Francis Carncross who said this was the death of distance. This was a network that knew no boundaries, respected no ge geographical limitations, and consequently can't really responsibly be regulated in buckets and chunks. We've understood this principle since the days of interstate commerce and trucking, in the environment, in all kinds of areas where you just don't have a ability to logically organize law around different state jurisdictions. I think there's no question that the internet is interstate in nature. Uh, it would be hazardous to regulate it in any other than a single comprehensive way. As a follow-up, uh, do you believe the FCC <coughs> currently has the authority to preempt attempts to regulate this issue at the state level? Uh, I do. That's been their position. Um, and I also believe that it would fall under conflict preemption, meaning the two regimes are not reconcilable. Uh, and one final question. Do you believe that the Washington state law and this legislation are consistent with the four internet freedoms you described in 2004 when you were chairman of the FCC? My limited understanding of it is yes. I think there are some aspects of it be examined more carefully, like specialized services. Uh, but I also would note it's a really productive uh, piece of work and didn't include anything that looks like Title II. Thank you. Okay, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the chair is going to request unanimous consent to enter the following documents into the record. Uh, an article from Free Press, a letter from Consumer Reports, a letter from the American Library Association, a letter from Tech Freedom Coalition, an article from Motherboard, an article from Financial Times, and a 2010 letter to form an, former FCC Chairman Janikowski. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses uh, for their participation in today's hearing. Uh, we genuinely appreciate you coming here, and uh, I want to remind members that pursuant to the committee rules, they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. To be answered by the witnesses who have appeared, I would ask each witness to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. Uh, at this time, the subcommittee is adjourned. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Uh, well, I was just, I was, and they left. I was, I was going to say, well, maybe we should talk about yeah. your, a DBA of Eastern Oregon helicopter in Mexico. Or, you know, so. Well, and that, you know, there's so much more we all.